Hey guys how are you all? Welcome back to my channel. Today we will see what if Konoha begs Naruto for forgiveness. If you enjoy then please like share and do comments. Naruto wanted to cry. He wanted to cry real badly. His eyes stung and his mind spun around. He was not sure the tears, if they would come, would be of sorrow or anger. They had betrayed him. All of them. Konoha had betrayed him, they had sided against him. All of them. Even Aruka. Hell, even Tsunade. Just because he lost control once, once. It was not like he had hurt anyone, no, he had saved them. He had killed the Akatsuki leader, successfully destroying one of the strongest organizations consisting of missing nens. And what was the thank you? A one-way ticket of Konoha with the warning to never return. Simple as that. Looks of hatred, eyes filled with fear. People talking, whispering their glee as he walked out through the gates. At the last second he had turned around, facing all of them. Tsunade stood in the front, her eyes were hard. Maybe she did not want him to go, but she was scared of him. Scared of what he could do, scared of what he might, possible do. They were not going to let him stay just to find out. Better be safe than sorry. Her eyes told Naruto that. He got angry then. He tore off the necklace she had given him. It felt so long ago, but it had only been a few years ago and he had been happy then, so happy, threw it on the ground in front of him and stomped on it. Tsunade heard a sound she never thought she would hear when it came to that necklace. Naruto lifted his foot. The necklace had cracked underneath his sandal, now laying broken just like his trust to them, to Konoha. He looked up with angry eyes at the shocked Hokage and screamed. I'll make you regret this. I will come back one day, too strong to be stopped by you, too powerful to be brought down. I will seek out the people who will appreciate me, people who don't give a shit of what I am. He then vanished, leaving behind a broken necklace, a broken promise. Now, a bit later, he was only sad. His heart was hurting with each beat it took. He had nowhere to go, because he knew no one. Maybe except for Inari and the guys at water, but he did not want to go there. They were happy with their new life. He was not sure he would ever be able to be happy again. The 15-year-old threw away the orange and black jacket. He could not stand the color now. He stopped liking orange in that quantity a few months ago. Sure, a few threads of orange in some clothing was fine, but even the new one Jiraiya had given him held too much orange. He was glad he had packed the other clothes Jiraiya had given him. He hoped he would reach a place where he could throw the pants away and dress in his new clothes. For now, he wore the orange pants and his black t-shirt. Right now he was just running ahead, having no idea what to do. He was under a henge, making him look a bit older and with brownish hair and green eyes. He was just being careful, who knew what people thought about him now. The teen stopped for a minute and rested. He was going to show them. He was going to show them what they missed. He was no longer the immature brat they had known. He had changed years ago. They just did not see it. He closed his eyes for a moment before moving on. He had to get as far away from Konoha as he could before he changed his mind and went to kill everyone. Kayubi was rumbling inside of him, his host's anger making even the great demon nervous. Maybe it was because Naruto had never felt such anger before. Killing them now won't solve anything, Kayubi said, hoping to calm the team down. I know but they piss me off, Naruto replied as he made another stop, looking around. He had moved far enough for today. He climbed higher up to where the leaves would shield him from others. He settled down onto a branch and closed his eyes. Kit, we need to talk. Talk on. I'm listening. With me still in you, people will always chase you, the demon spoke. Yes, I thought we established that some years ago, Naruto could not help but say. Don't talk back to me, brat. I'm serious. If you are to grow strong, you can't have two different chakras in your body. It's not like we can just pull you out, Naruto muttered out. The teen opened his eyes and looked up at the demon. He was in his mindscape, the demon looking down at him. Kayubi sighed and with a swirl of red chakra he changed into human form behind the bars. Naruto walked through the bars and sat down. Kayubi followed. He had fierce red hair, red eyes, tanned skin and dressed in red armor. He had tried, without success, to get rid of all the red a few years ago, causing some humor for his host. There is a way, the demon said and looked away. A painful way. Tell me, Naruto said. You do a ritual of sorts. Kayubi said and looked at him briefly. Everyone says removing your demon from you will kill you, but that's only if you go the normal way. The normal way? 
Yes, the one Akatsuki has done on Gara for an example. But that is forced removal. They never considered the host and the demon to be, on friendly terms, like us. That gives us another possibility to release me from you. That ritual? Naruto asked eagerly. It's painful for you, the demon said, not for me. You undo the seal while doing the ritual. The demon helps their host by beginning to push out. You need a human sacrifice, because the only way you can bring me out is if I have this human form. Will you have it forever? Or will you be a normal human? I will have my human form forever, Kayubi said. There is no way avoiding that. I will not be a human though. The sacrifice is merely to give me blood and flesh instead the way I am now, spirit. If we succeed, your own chakra will begin to grow, to expand, adjust to being alone, Kayubi said and scratched his cheek with a claw-like nail. It will be hard the first few months, but I know you have enormous chakra reserves even without mine. Everyone tried to teach to you rely on my chakra, and that made your own retreat pretty much. Naruto looked down for a few moments, his arms crossed. Kayubi watched him quietly, letting his host decide the next actions all on his own. Then Naruto looked up again and said, What kind of sacrifice do you want? Man, woman or child? Three days later, are you really sure about this, Naruto? Yes, now go on with it. The demon sighed and then took Naruto through the ritual once before the team would do it. Naruto had drawn the circle with his blood as the demon had requested and was now kneeling down in the middle. Before him lay a man whose throat had been slit. The man had no name in Naruto's mind, as he never bothered to ask it. He did not know if the man had any family, and had not cared. He just was at the wrong place at the wrong time. At least his death had been swift and painless. Once Kayubi had explained Naruto put his palms on the man's chest. The demon inside of the team took a deep breath. There was always the slim chance some of his chakra remained in Naruto and that would mean Naruto had to merge with the chakra, making him more of a demon. Naruto knew this risk, and did not care. He said it was fine. Lately, many things had been fine with the team. The ritual began. Kayubi began to push himself out from Naruto, out from the mind, and from the body. It was somewhat strange doing it, but Kayubi had been involved in a lot of strange situations and feelings during the years he had been alive. He hoped no one would come, attracted to the screaming Naruto did. The teen himself was not aware he had begun to scream, the demon so far succeeded to soothe the pain away. As Kayubi's arm left Naruto's body, Naruto could start feeling the pain. He threw his head back, his eyes rolling back and his scream began anew. The demon's arm found the sacrifice and held onto the body as he began to drag himself out. It was a really, really strange situation but Kayubi was not about to complain. After several painful minutes, Kayubi with a last yank pulled his foot out and went into the sacrifice which immediately began to change into the demon's form. Naruto fell to the ground, writhing in pain. The body was now formed and ready but Kayubi was rather stiff, he had not moved around in a real body for a very long time. He managed to turn his head towards Naruto and groaned in misery at the sight. Some of his chakra was still within the team, just as he feared. He moved slowly, finally arriving at the writhing body. Naruto, he said, holding the shaking body as still as he could with his stiff arms. The teen gave no indication that he had heard the demon. His body continued to twitch and his eyes were still rolled back. Naruto, wake up, some of my chakra is still left within you. Naruto finally regained some sorts of senses and looked at Kayubi. Some of your chakra? He got out. Yes, that is why you still are in pain. Merge with it, embrace it, and make it to your own. I don't know how, Naruto gritted out, his body twitching in the demon's arms. Go to your mindscape. In my cage the chakra will be. Embrace it with your arms, and it will merge with you, Kayubi said. Go now. Naruto did as Kayubi told him. Two years later, a boy no older than seven years old was running for his life. His thin legs carried him faster than normal, but not fast enough to shake loose of his followers. Men and women, older than him, stronger than him, wiser than him. Their screaming made the tears fall faster. Why? Why do they chase me? What have I done to them? Why are they trying to kill me? Why am I the only different one? Monster. Freak. Demon. You should never have been born. Stop you stupid brat. We'll put you out of your misery. The boy cried harder and tried to run faster. He slipped and with a crash was sent to the ground. He skidded to a halt and tried to get up. His leg protested, having been hurt in the fall. 
His wide eyes, filled with tears and pain, turned to look at the group of people who now stood in a half circle around him. You're fast for being such a small brat, one man said with a grin. He was holding an axe. But this is the end. There is nowhere you can run. The boy scooted backwards, wailing and calling for help. Suddenly he bumped into something, something warm but hard. He looked up. A person. Another one? Had he taken a different route than the others to make sure the boy would have nowhere to escape? Tears welled up faster in the boy's eyes. Who are you? The man with the axe asked. You from the village? Sorry, the light isn't so good. You want to have a go with him first? Get out of my sight, the person growled, his voice deep and ominous but soothing for the boy. What did you say, you bastard? Someone screamed. I don't like repeating myself, low lives, the man snarled. Get out of my sight before I slay you all. They retreated a bit before a woman shouted. He's only one and we are twenty. Plus he has to protect the brat. You're right. The man with the axe shouted. Get ready to die, stranger. The person crouched down next to the boy and said. Close your eyes, child. Two fingers gently helped him. The person rose up and the boy curled up. He did not want to see the nice man get killed. He heard their shouts as they charged. He whimpered and bit his lip. The nice man was going to die because of him. And then they were going to kill him. They were going to kill the nice man and him for nothing. They were just scared of the unknown and killed what they were scared off. Suddenly screams erupted from a woman, followed shortly by a man. The boy heard something splatter onto the ground but squeezed his eyes shut even harder and put his hands over his ears. After a few minutes, everything was silent again. The boy realized no one was attacking him, removed his hands and opened his eyes. Only to stare at the scene before him in shock. Twenty corpses lay on the forest floor. The nice man cleaned off a katana from blood its steel shining in the moonlight with each swift swipe with the cloth. A gentle wind began to blow and the moon shone onto the man's face. The boy's eyes widened in wonder. The man looked young, had purple eyes and tattoos underneath them. His skin was almost white, making the eyes and tattoos appear much darker than what they probably were. But that was not what interested the boy. The man had sharp teeth and pointed ears sticking out from the wild and long black red hair. The man was dressed in a long, black trench coat and underneath a pair of baggy black pants, a belt to which several scrolls were attached and the now sheathed katana hanging on his left hip. He wore nothing on his torso or on his feet. The finger and toenails were sharp and looking a bit like claws. The man now turned to the boy and walked over to him. He crouched down and with gentle movements cleaned away the salty liquid from the boy's cheeks. The claw-like nails scratched his skin a bit but the boy did not get scared. The movements were gentle, not meant to harm him. Who are you? The boy asked in awe. I bear no name, the man replied, for it would be a disgrace to my parents if I continued to use it. A friend of mine calls me Sora, for when I was young my eyes matched the color of a bright sky. Oh, so you're, Sora-san? The boy said. Yes, I am. And who might you be? Sora asked. I don't have a name, the boy said and looked away. They always say monster to me. Why? Because I guess I am one. Never call yourself a monster, child, the man said angrily. It will only pain you. How do you know? For the people I lived with before, in my former village, I was a monster, Sora said quietly, making the boy whip his head up to stare at the man. They barely knew my name, so used were they to call me monster. It took me a long time to understand why they did what they did and once I had found out. I was already too deep down in the line of hatred. The boy began to cry again. No, not crying, Sora said. I was hoping it would cheer you up to know you are not alone. But they were mean to Sora-san, the boy cried. They shouldn't have been mean to Sora-san, because he's a very kind person. Sora's eyes softened a bit and he said. People do not see us that way. Us? We too are not alone, Sora said. I am traveling village to village in search of my own people. You are so far the youngest I have found. Me? The boy asked, eyes wide. I am, one of your people? Cast away like rags, Sora said bitterly. Thrown out without a care. Led to a life full of hatred and wishes of revenge. I was like that, until a year ago. I had spent one year by then away from the village I bore such hatred to, and felt very alone. My friend asked me, if I was so alone, why not build myself a village so I can protect my people? You are building a village? The boy asked, excited. My friend are helping the ones I have promised a better life to build it while I travel, 
trying to save those who are in need. Would you like to follow me? The boy's eyes widened even more, if that was possible. I can go with Sora-san? He asked in shock. Yes, you can go with me. But, but I'm nothing. I'm just a child, I can't do anything. I don't even have a name and... Yokazi, one, eh? That will be your name, so I can remember where I met you. Where the wind of the night brought us together. The boy looked at Sora, his lower lip trembling. But, he tried again. I will tell you something, a deep secret, Sora said. Something only my friend knows of so far. I will share this secret with you to make you understand my trust in you, Yokazi. He liked the name. How easily it was given to him. By this man. By his savior. Okay, newly named Yokazi said. Sora smiled and leaned closer. His black and red bangs brushed Yokaze's cheek. The man smelled faintly of blood and sakura blossoms. A scent Yokazi loved as soon as he felt it. The smell of his savior, the smell of Sora San. I will tell you my real name, the name my father gave me before he died, Sora whispered. Yokazi nodded fervently, showing he was ready. I was born as Uzumaki Naruto in the hidden village of Leaf, Konoha. Naruto San, Yokazi whispered. Sora looked at the boy and said, That name is but a mere memory now. I shall not disgrace my mother or my father by calling myself that. They died to save a village I have no love for. They died for people I rather want to see dead. I am going against that village, although not wishing for war, and therefore must bury my old name. Just as everyone else in my village, your village, has. They have? They cast away who they were, and became a new person, the man said with a smile. Just as I did, just as you have done. Yokazi stared at the man before him. Someone who understood. Someone who called him something else than monster. Someone who gave him a name to call his own. Someone who accepted him. Tsunade felt old. Very old. She had felt this way ever since that day. Ever since she let her fear take control, and cave under the other's wishes. To throw the demon out. No, not the demon. Naruto. To throw Naruto out. The look Naruto had given her. The necklace she had given him crumbled easily underneath his rage, just as her heart crumbled. As with the necklace, no one was able to pick up the pieces. That was fifteen years ago. Fifteen long years, not one day passing before she wondered if he was alright, if Naruto was safe, if he even was alive. If he was ever found, she would apologize to him every day for the rest of her miserable life. He probably did not want anything to do with Konoha. They had all betrayed him, and almost everyone had moved on. Not she though. Jiraiya had not been in the village at the time but once he showed up and learned what had happened, he had walked out of the gate. No one had managed to find him after that. Uruka had realized what he had done, he realized he had pushed Naruto away, and he realized it not long after Naruto had left. The pain had been too much only after a few months, now he was just another dead person, another grave Tsunade visited. Everyone had said dying by suicide was a disgrace for a shinobi and he should not be buried. Tsunade had replied with she would dig the grave herself if she had to, and kindly knocked out those who protested the most. The only thing she regretted of that whole ordeal was the fact that Aruka was dead. To her surprise, Aburame Shino had stood up for Naruto along with Nara Shikamaru and Hayuga Neji. Their parents and Neji's uncle Hayuga Hiyashi had been told by others to make sure their kids changed opinions. The teens had not changed their opinions at all. Only Hiyashi tried to make Neji think differently while Shibi and Shikaku had told their sons to follow what they felt was right. And one day 14 years ago the three teens had simply left, leaving behind their Hitai Atesh. They had yet to be found although Tsunade had shown their respect for Naruto by not looking for them too hard. They clearly did not want to be found. Everyone else though, they were busy with their lives, although some of them missed the blonde. It was just they did not feel as guilty. They saw him as a danger, just like the rest of the village. They did not understand. She looked outside, her eyes tired. Gara would soon come. He was the case cage, and despite being more than pissed off at Konoha for their treatment on his best friend, he had not broken the alliance although it had been on thin ice for a year or two after Naruto had been thrown out. For his generosity she would be forever grateful, fully knowing they did not deserve Gara and the protection he could give in case of war. Of course Tsunade had for a while tried to find Naruto but had given up the search eight years ago. He simply did not want to be found and she had to accept that. It knocked on the door, breaking her out from her thoughts. She called out and the case cage entered. 
She rose up and greeted him with the normal hug. How are you, Tsunade? He asked as they pulled apart a bit. You look unwell. I've looked unwell for 15 years, she said and sat down. It won't change. Fear causes strange reactions, makes people act irrational. I myself have experienced it, Gara said, and acted rather irrational as everyone else would have done. At least you didn't throw out an innocent villager from his village and forbid him to come back, she said and rested her head in her hand. Gara saw the guilt was wearing down on her. She maybe had experienced the fear for a few days, the rest of the days she had lived in misery. Most people in this village deserved this misery but not she, not Tsunade. Not when she almost killed herself trying to find Naruto. If only Uruka had been alive and with her. They might have been better if they had been closer. Now there was no chance for the brunette to meet Naruto again, and it made the redhead sad. Shall we get down to business? She asked, breaking him from his thoughts this time. Yes, I guess we should, he said absently as he searched his robes for a scroll. It should be him sitting here, she said suddenly and Gara looked up at her. Naruto, it should be him sitting where I sit, and argue with you. It shouldn't be me. I should be in a nice, cozy house and play the senile old hag I am. You are brooding about this far more than usual, he said carefully. Today it's exactly 15 years since he was forced to leave, she said. I'm not in the best mood. I see. I will try to do this meeting as short as possible then. If I recall right your village is in need of some money. Yes, we need to change some of the Anbu equipment but can't spare any money at the moment, Tsunade said. As I can't allow the Anbu going after missing nins without the right equipment, we are in a bit of a tight situation. There are a number of missing nins who each are worth a lot, Gara said and took out a scroll. Here are their names and the information I found on them. They are hunted by all hidden villages, but as you know the situation in most of the villages are the same as in Konoha. Except for Suna it seems, if you willingly give this up, she said and held up the scroll. We captured one recently, the redhead said, and was therefore able to collect a big sum of money over the normal amount. With that money, we will last for quite some time as most of our equipment is in good condition. I envy you, she muttered and took a look at the different persons. Did Suna Anbu catch your missing nin? No, I sent out a group of Junins, he said. Of course, my sister was among them. With her, I guess the missing nin gave up rather quickly. Yes, Gara said, he had heard about her and had no wish to fight her. Unfortunately we don't have anyone like that. You have Kakashi and Sasuke. Sharing in users, no one wants to fight against them. Perhaps, Tsunade said and narrowed her eyes in thought. I could always send out Hinata as well. No one desires to fight against Baikugan either. I will let you plan in peace, he said and rose up. Are you going back to Suna? Not immediately. I thought I should visit Uruka san's grave before I left. Gara visited the grave every time he was in Konoha, and this day seemed to be no exception. All right, she said and looked outside. You know, if I could, I would do as Jiraiya did. Walk out of the gate without looking back? Yes, this village, before I swore to protect them all but now. I don't feel like protecting those who cast away whatever they fear. But then again, I'm no better than them. Is someone missing him? Gara asked quietly, looking at the woman. Tsunade was silent for a while. Then she said, besides me, Sasuke. He was unconscious after a mission at the time, so he could not say anything but I know he was angry. Still is. I have no doubt you will meet him at Uruka's grave. That man drinks more sake than me sometimes. Sasuke? Gara asked in surprise. On the date when we banished Naruto, I know it's useless to send him out on a mission, she said. He is by Uruka's grave most of the day, more often than not drinking. I see. Is there someone else? Not really, she said and looked out again. Wait, Kakashi as well, Naruto's teacher. He's a lazy bastard but he does whatever he can to make things easier for me. I even heard him once shout at some of the elders to the clans because they insulted Naruto. Man, that was the funniest moment of that year. Their faces. I'll never forget it. So he's green. The others though. They can talk about the good old times, Naruto's jokes and stuff like that but. I can't say they miss him. Most of them probably think they did the right thing. The right thing, Gara repeated. If Tamari had heard them, she would have knocked each of them over the head with her fan, multiply times. I believe you, she said with a chuckle. I wish I could beat some sense into them, but then I would be removed and the village would really become chaos. Have you thought of a Roku dame? 
I have, she said. And the answer is the same. Still Sasuke? Yes. I asked him a couple of weeks ago, and he didn't seem to mind, she said with a smile. With a pissed off Uchiha as a leader, this village will feel some pain it deserves. Gara chuckled at the image it brought forth in his head. He had rarely seen Sasuke pissed off but once the man lost it, he really lost it. He will make a fine Rokudame, and I will look forward to nag with him for many years to come, Gara said. I will be going then. Take care, Tsunade said. And thank you for the information. Merely helping a friend, he said and waved as he left. The case cage walked between graves and saw a still form beside the grave he knew belonged to Amino Aruka. He looked back at his brother Konkuro and the man dressed in black nodded before walking away to leave the two alone for a bit. Uchiha Sasuke looked up as Gara closed in. The Sharingan user was dressed in loose, baggy black pants, a white shirt and a black vest over that. His Hitai 8 was tied around his neck and a katana was resting on the ground beside him. The man held a cup of sake in his hand. Tsunade said you might be here, the case cage said and kneeled down. He brushed away some stray leaves that was on the grave and looked at the name. She wants me to be Rokudame, Sasuke said. Yes, she told me that. I'm of mixed opinions right now about that. Why? Well, if I will become Rokudame I can shape up this piece of shit village but my freedom will be limited immensely, he said and took a sip of his drink. He did not appear to be drunk. Tsunade-sama knows I enjoy my freedom, and that is why she lets me leave the village whenever I want to. That is why she named you Asani, allowing you to go whenever you feel like it. Yes, but I do missions for her, the man said. I wear the Hitai 8 to show I'm still a Konoha Shinobi. Sometimes though I just want to throw it away and run the fastest I can. But you don't do it. I can't do it to her. She feels I'm the only one who can actually change this village. The elders to the clans don't listen very well to her nowadays. She says herself it's soon for her to step away. Sasuke said and looked at the grave. Gara said nothing to it. He was offered some sake and they drank in silence for a while. Then the redhead spoke up. I wouldn't mind having you as a Rokudame, but if another one is chosen instead of you, I don't know how I will react. If it is someone who hates Naruto, I don't think I can hold the alliance. Don't worry, if it comes to that, I will take my things and, with Kakashi's help, drag Tsunade to Suna, Sasuke said reassuringly. I can live with the heat. Gara smiled at that. It seems like not quite everything is lost yet. Sora. The group of odd people looked at each other in confusion. Sasuke looked away after a few moments and sighed. Damn Tsunade for sending him out on a mission with others. He had told her he was a loner, damn it. Kakashi sighed as well and wondered what he was needed for. He was really not in a mood to do a mission at all. He had not been ever since Aruka took his own life. The academy teacher and Kakashi had been rather close thanks to Naruto, but then when the teen was banished it all shattered. Kakashi had kept his feelings inside, not telling whether he was happy or sad that the teen was gone. Of course he had been afraid when he had seen Kayubi in action, who would not be, but later when he reflected about it the demon had not tried to hurt them. He had simply directed all his anger and rage on the Akatsuki leader, and then withdrawn to leave Naruto in charge again. Most of the people had not seen that, they only assumed that Naruto could not control the demon. When Aruka had died Kakashi knew the village had made a mistake banishing Naruto. He had told Tsunade as such, and she had only looked at him with grief-stricken eyes. Then she had said, we can't undo the mistakes we've done, and we can't make Naruto forgive us. He knew that, and had therefore tried to do what he could to ease Tsunade's worries. He took whatever mission she gave him without any complaint. He stopped being late, and he found himself defending Naruto on several occasions. He shook himself out of it when Tsunade entered the room. They all murmured their greetings and she greeted them before sitting down. She let her eyes roam over their faces. To the very left was Sasuke, probably uncomfortable and pissed off at her. He was a loner after all. Next to him was Kakashi, subdued and looking off somewhere in space. Then there was Hinata, Sakura, Kiba, Lee and Ino. They simply looked confused. Listen up, she said and they snapped to attention. I know you are aware of our economic situation at the moment. Therefore I will send you out as a team to capture some missing nins that will bring us up. They looked at her. No, I'm not joking, she said. Kakashi, you will be the team leader. On this scroll are 10 missing nins. 
I want you to try capturing at least one of them. Kakashi accepted the scroll and opened it. These are all S class, he said and looked at her. Yes, she said. However, if you work as a team these people won't be a problem. You are to move out when you are ready and have decided who to choose. Kakashi, you will report to me who you have chosen before you leave. Understood, Hokage-sama. Good. Dismissed. The guy they had chosen was from Mist and relied a lot on his ninjutsu. They set out to find him two days later. Kakashi ran first, and slightly behind him was Sasuke. The others were a bit scattered out, not speaking. It was a long time since either of them had worked together on a mission. After a while Sakura spoke up though. Kakashi, the information of the man. Did it tell us his last known location? Yes, the copy Nin replied. Last time he was seen was a week ago in Wind Country. That is where we are heading and gather information along the way. Okay, she said. She slowed down a bit so she was running alongside Ino. Lee ran up to Kakashi and said. I heard that Tsunade-sama made another attempt to find Neji and the others. Yes, the older man said and looked at the black-haired one. It was futile. Either they are dead or have hidden themselves too well. Why did they disappear? Lee asked. I know they were on Naruto's side but did they have to disappear because of it? Maybe they felt they had to, Kakashi said shortly, not really wanting to talk about the past. What's done is done. All we can hope is that they are alive and well, since we haven't heard anything about someone finding a dead Hyuga, Aburame or Nara. Lee looked down for a moment and then said something that shocked the older shinobi. We didn't appreciate Naruto as much as we should have, right? We let our fear get in the way. At least you, Tsunade-sama and Sasuke-san isn't that way. The black-haired Junin slowed down until he was running alongside Kiba, Kakashi staring back at him for a few moments. Then he had to focus to where he was running. Man, this is boring. Don't complain. Shut up. I can complain if I want to. But only as long as you are away from the village. Three people walked down a dusty road, dressed in heavy, white hooded cloaks which covered their whole body and with white masks covering their faces. One of them was a woman, and the other two were men. The woman spoke up again, her voice calm and smooth. But going all this way, couldn't we have chosen anyone else? One of the men said. We are beginning with him, and then work our way up back home. That makes sense, she admitted, but Onikage-sama said we shouldn't be gone for so long. Come on, the other man said. We can beat the crap out of them and move home within a few days. Not with the pace we're going right now, the woman muttered. They were an odd little group in the middle of wind country. The hot sun was glaring down at them but they seemed fine in their cloaks. One of them suddenly stopped and removed the mask. It was the woman. Her white eyes glared up at the sky for a moment, burying fangs between vermilion lips for a moment before looking down at the two. Her face was pale, so was the rest of her body. It's hot behind the mask, she complained. The gills on her throat flexed and green hair fell down in her eyes. She blew at the bangs irritably. Suck it up and deal with it, Yasha, one of the men said. Although I guess we can remove them for a moment here. He removed his mask as well and used it a bit as a fan. Black long hair framed his slightly tanned face, frosty blue eyes watching Yasha's attempts of getting the hair out of her face. It's so easy for you to say, Yokazi, the other man complained. At least you look normal enough to not be attacked every few seconds. He removed his and yellow eyes glanced over at Yasha. The skin was pale as well, and he stuck out a snake-like tongue at Yokazi who was not phased by it. True, but you can always use a henge, Makai, Yokazi reminded. The man did not reply. Yasha gave up and looked at them. Shall we continue? She asked. To where there isn't any sun. Looks like it's rather impossible at this location, Makai muttered. They looked around. They were, after all, in a desert. Then let's get our asses moving, Yasha growled and pushed at their backs, making them go forward. I ain't staying here longer than necessary. Damn, how fast is this guy? The Konahead team was currently chasing their guy through the desert. It was late afternoon and it had taken them three days to find him. He had been hanging around in wind country longer than they expected but they sure would not complain about it. Kakashi ran beforehand, hearing Kiba's frustrated yell. The man was fast, really fast. It was almost like he was flying over the sand. He may not be good in taijutsu but he had speed on his side. We have to attack simultaneously, the copy Nin shouted. Understood. The rest of the Konoha shinobis called out. 
They ran up to him and spread out like a half circle. The missing Nin looked behind himself and seemed to grit his teeth before turning back and trying to run faster. We're almost there, Kakashi shouted, ready yourselves to attack. They all prepared, when something unexpected happened. Between Sakura and Lee, a person in white cloak and white mask ran past them like it was nothing. They stared in shock as that person shouted out. Makai, take him out. It was a woman's voice. A much taller person ran past Sasuke and Kakashi and with a swift summoning technique brought a scythe out. He jumped up in the air and a third person dressed the same as the other two came up. Yasha, if Makai's attack failure up, the person shouted. Got it. She screamed and ran ahead. Just make sure you got the transportation ready, Yokazi. Yokazi brought out a scroll and ran after Yasha. The Konoha team stared at the three. Makai's scythe hid down just in front of the missing Nen, making him fall over. He got up and began to prepare a technique when Yasha ran up and kicked him square in the face. He fell to the ground and Makai picked him up on one shoulder. He dismissed the scythe and grabbed a hold of the much shorter Yasha. Yokazi jumped up in the air and the scroll spun around him and the three others. He made a seal and shouted, Transport. In the next moment, they were gone leaving behind some very confused people. You failed? Tsunade looked at them in shock. Kakashi bowed his head and said, Yes, our target was taken. Taken? Yes. We have no idea who they were. All we know what I think is their names. Yasha, Makai and Yokazi. Their faces? Didn't see them, or any signs of what village they came from. They wore white masks and white cloaks. Tsunade slumped back and looked at them. White masks and white cloaks? she said. They nodded. I'll try to find out who they are. What should we do about them? Kiba asked. Nothing, she said. These missing nins were hunted by everyone. Someone just simply got before us. You should have seen their faces, Onikage-sama. The man behind the desk seemed to tilt his head, an amused smile on his face as he watched his people. Makai was laughing as he retold how the Konoha team looked, his snake-like tongue sticking out from time to time. Yasha was grinning widely as well but at least kept herself to their rapport, well, most of the time she did. Yokazi stood silent and filled in the report on a paper, serious as always. Purple eyes shifted over to the man and the gaze softened. Yokazi noticed he was being stared on and looked up. Is there something wrong, Onikage-sama? he asked. No, the man replied. He shook his black red hair out of his face and when the bangs failed to cooperate he reached up a clawed hand and swept it away. It stubbornly fell back. Yokazi, without thinking, reached over and gently tucked the bangs behind one pointed ear. Makai and Yasha did not pay much attention to the tender move as they had seen it many times before. Yokazi was the one who made sure their Onikage had everything he needed, the one who never refused what the older man said. The black-haired man was the one who Onikage seemed to trust the most because Yokazi was one of the few who knew their Onikage's true name. So you met Konoha? The Onikage said once Makai had finished. Yeah, Makai said, they probably snapped up our names. That's quite alright, the man behind the desk said. No damage done. They are bound to find out about us sooner or later. Is there anything else? Don't think so, Yasha said and turned to Yokazi. Did I and Makai miss anything? If you did, it will be written down so Onikage-sama can read it later if he so wishes, the blue-eyed man said. You two are dismissed, the violet-eyed man said, smiling at the two. Yokazi, a word. The two bounced to the door and it opened soundlessly. As it closed Yokazi relaxed his posture and said, Is there something special, Sora-san? No, Sora replied and looked at the young man he considered closer than a brother. Perhaps even like a son despite the fact Yokazi was only 10 years younger than him. I felt a bit lonely. Why? Yokazi said. I was sure Mibana got tried of sitting by the desk outside and came in here for a chat once in a while. Of course, but, but what? Yokazi was slightly worried now. It had been a long time since the younger man had seen the troubled look on his savior's face. Konoha, they are not a threat to us, the younger man said firmly. Oh, I know that. Your encounter with Konoha. Describe the people for me. They were seven in total. The apparent leader was a man with gray hair and the hit eye ate covering his left eye. He had a mask over his lower face. Next to him was a man with black and white clothing, black hair, a katana and seemingly strange red eyes. 
a pink-haired woman along with a pale blonde one, both dressed in standard Junin outfits, a black-haired male with Junin vest over some spandex suit. It was green anyway, a wild-looking man with marks on his cheeks and a Junin vest over a fur coat. And lastly a Hayuga. Let's see then, Sora said and leaned back, his eyes closed, gray-haired one, Hitaki Kakashi, red eyes, Uchiha Sasuke, pink-haired, Haruno Sakura, pale blonde, must be Ino, Yamanaka Ino, spandex guy, definitely Rock Lee, guy with marks, Kiba, can't be any other, Inazuka Kiba, he didn't have a dog with him? No, Yokazi said carefully, it's alright, just asking. The last one, a Hayuga, either Hinata or Hanabi, were they all in the same age? Roughly except for this Hitaki Kakashi. He looked older. Then the Hayuga was Hinata, the Onikage confirmed. Well, those are faces I have not seen in a while. The man reached to take a cup of forgotten tea from the desk but the cup shattered underneath his grip. Sora blinked. Yokazi sighed, grabbed the man's hand and examined it gently for any pieces. The hand was smooth and pale his nails long and sharp. No cuts, no blood. Good, Yokazi never liked seeing Sora bleeding. I must be more upset than I thought, Sora said absently as his hand was released and he rose up. Maybe I should clean this mess up. He saved a few documents from the spilt tea and asked, when is Gara coming? Tomorrow, Yokazi said, I see. Yokazi looked on as the man cleaned up, slightly worried. Are you still angry at Konoha, Sora-san? Mildly I suppose, he replied. Wouldn't you be? I guess so. Tsunade lowered the papers with a confused look. The group of seven people looked at her. She had told them she had found out who had taken the target from them. Kiba had wanted to beat them up just a bit but she had told him not to. Who is it then? Kakashi finally asked. White cloaks and white masks are normal from the new hidden village created three years ago, Tsunade said and looked at them. Have you ever heard anything about it? No, they all replied. Well, she continued, this village is special. What do you mean? Sakura asked. It's called the Hidden Village of Blood, Tsunade said. The shinobi and civilians living there are mostly demons and outcasts from other villages. Shortly said, a village supposedly filled with power and hatred. Of course we must seek this village out. Destroy them. Monsters the whole bunch. They are the ones who will try to destroy us first unless we act. Monsters are not to be trusted. Tsunade was getting a headache, and from the pounding against her temples, it was going to be a bad one. She suppressed the urge to scream right out. She was in a meeting with the council, consisting of the elders of the clans, Sarutobi's former teammates and Danzo. They were all currently screaming different things to her. Well, almost all of them. Abarame Shibi sat silent, probably preferring to be somewhere else. Ever since his son disappeared he had been quieter than usual and withdrawn. Same thing with Nara Shikaku, only he never showed up on these meetings. He simply sat at home during that time, only coming when Tsunade had a mission for him or demanded his presence at the meetings. She massaged her temples and then shouted out. Shut the hell up, they did so, surprisingly. Normally they would have ignored her. She looked up at them, fire in her eyes and said. We don't know anything about this village yet. We don't even know where it is. First we will seek them out and I will meet with their leader. If they bear no ill intentions, then we will show them the same respect. You don't show monsters respect, Utatane Kaharu said, her lips in a thin line. Well, I will and I will make the village do so as well, Tsunade snapped. This meeting is over, get out. Tsunade wanted to bang her head against the table. How hard was it for these people to get it? She was not going to declare war against a village she had no idea where it was, what people existed there and who the leader was. They, almost the whole council, she emphasized almost, had argued it was probably like Orochimaru's village, the sound village. She had after that thrown them out and placed an Anbu guard outside the office to get rid of them for a little while. Shibi was allowed to leave from the window sill, preferring not to walk down the same corridor of the screaming and arguing people. Not that she blamed him. As for earlier, she did not like to be reminded of Orochimaru in any way, or even hear his name. The man had so far escaped all plans they had made to kill him, and was most likely sitting and laughing at them nowadays. Tsunade gritted her teeth and tried to concentrate on paperwork. A few minutes later it knocked on the door. She looked up, irritated. She had told the Anbu she did not want to be disturbed. 
The man opened the door and said, Tsunade Sama, Case Cage Sama is here to see you. Oh, show him in. Well, Gara was different. He could disturb her all he wanted. Gara stepped through and closed the door. Have you done something to upset your counsel? He asked curiously. I refused to let them open war against a new hidden village, she said. Oh, what village? Hidden village of blood, she said, gesturing to a thin map to her left. That's all I can find about them. Isn't it rather rare that someone created a village for demons and outcasts? Gara said as he flipped through the map absently. It was more a challenge than a question. It's nice for those who are so-called demons and outcasts, Tsunade replied as she signed another paper. I said myself if they bear no ill intentions, we won't either. I guess that didn't go home with the rest. Are you kidding me? I thought I would go deaf with all the yelling. Is that so? Gara put down the map and looked at her. What will you do? First of all I will try to find where the village is and then I guess send some kind of message to the leader, she said and massaged her temples. Then we'll see. Hidden village of blood. Gara mused, a small smile on his lips. Somehow, Tsunade had the feeling he knew more than he said. Several days later, a meeting yet again. At least Gara was with her this time. The council members sat down and Danzo spoke up. Well, Tsunade Heim? She hated how he mocked her by calling her that. Have you found out where the village is so we can prepare for an attack? There will be no attacking, she said. If you don't follow that order, Danzo, I will have you killed. The statement was cold, straightforward and true. Danzo froze at the chilling tone and the look of utter hatred in her face. She would kill him if he did anything that she did not approve of. As you wish, he mumbled out and looked away, angry. How dare she try to control him? He was not someone who would be controlled, but instead he should be the one ruling Konoha. Tsunade, ignoring Danzu's fuming expression, looked at the others. We are not going to attack this village. Are we clear on that point? They all nodded. We are not to call them monsters or any other degrading names, she continued. Understood? After some hesitation they all nodded. Good. Now, this is what I have found out. Most of them leaned forward eagerly, her previous statements already forgotten. She sighed, they were hopeless. She should never have accepted becoming a Hokage. Nonetheless, she started speaking. The village is on an island called Death's Cliff. There is only one way for normal people to get there and that is with a boat that goes to water country four times a week. Most of the people on the island are fishermen, and from what I have found out they have nothing against to have a shinobi village at the island. In fact, they seem to like it since the money the village gets in they also share with the rest of the island. That doesn't say much, Inazuka Sume said. I still don't know what kind of leader they have. Tsunade began. Gara got tired of the charade and spoke. They call him Onikage. They all stared at the red-headed man. He had his arms crossed and looked at them before continuing. You speak of attacking them. Yes, Hayuga Hiyashi said. They are not humans. They are as much human as everyone else, Gara said. It's their looks that are different. You have met them? Tsunade asked, eyes wide. Yes, Gara said and now they all stared at him once more. Why? Hiyashi demanded to know. Onikage invited me, Gara said, amused by their reactions. An alliance was created between us when the village was finished over three years ago, the last push Suna helped them with to get everything up and running. Attacking them will mean war against Suna. You are allied with a village with monsters? Mitokado Homura ground out, glaring at him. Gara's temper flared but before they got any further it knocked on the door. Sarutobi Asuma opened the door, looked at them all in turns and then said, jabbing a thumb over his shoulder. Strange looking guy wants to see Tsunade Sama. He said it was important. All the ANBUs in the room tensed slightly. She waved at him and he stepped aside, allowing the strange looking guy in. Her mouth fell open. A man dressed in a white cloak and white mask stepped inside. His movements were smooth, silent, like the wind. He bowed to her and spoke. Our great leader Onikage Sama has sent me, Yokazi, to bring you a message from him, Tsunade Haim. Yokazi, one of the people who took the target from them. She barely managed to nod and Yokazi stepped forward. He brought his hands out, one of them holding scroll. He gave it to one of the Anbu who could check it over before giving it to Tsunade. He bowed once more to Gara and said, Good evening, Case Cage Sama. Good evening, Yokazi, Gara said. Did Onikage Sama use you because of your technique? If anything was to go wrong, I can disappear within an instant, Yokazi said. 
That was why he chose me. Plus you are almost the only polite person against those who are above you, Gara reminded. Yokazi laughed softly and removed his mask. The council members sat on needles as the two spoke. Tsunade was busy reading what Onikage had written to her. I was saved when I was young, Yokazi said and tilted his head. Many of our people had learned to hate those above them as they were old, while I was a mere child when Onikage-sama saved me. He taught me that hatred is not all that exists. Gara nodded and said, How is my brother faring in your village? Very well, Yokazi said with a smile. The children enjoys when he fastens strings on Makai and make him a marionette. With Makai? I dare say my brother has a death wish. Makai's bark is worse than his bite, Yokazi admitted. At least when it comes to Konkuro-sama. Tsunade had finished reading and looked up at Yokazi. He stood straighter and looked at her. He wishes to meet me, she spoke. As our village is an ally to Suna, we were also an ally to him. Onikage-sama prefers peace before war, Yokazi said. He does not wish to become Konoha's enemy. Hopefully. He said to send a reply back with you with a date when he should arrive. Onikage-sama thought you would feel safer if he came than that you traveled to our island. Plus he wanted to see what had happened to this place. She nodded absently and thought for a while. Is it too early to meet him in four days? The council went white in horror. She was not suggesting letting the Onikage come here? Not at all, Tsunade Haim, Yokazi said. He would be honored to know you wish to meet him that soon. The sooner the better. In four days then, around three in the afternoon, she said. You can just ask for me once you arrive here at Hokage Tower. Understood. Is that all, Tsunadeheim? Yes, you may leave. Yokazi nodded and put his mask on. He turned to Gara and said, I will see you later then, Case Cage sama Yes, take care and send my regards to Onikage and Konkuro. The man nodded and put his hands into a seal. Within a moment, he melted away into the background and then he was gone. Are you out of your mind, Tsunade-sama? You are inviting the leader of that village to Konoha like it's nothing? Sakura could make a good imitating of any council members, Tsunade thought absently before she replied. No, I'm not out of my mind. I'm stretching out a hand to offer friendship, and I hope you will accept. This is crazy. With all the monsters in that village. Sakura, that's enough. Is this because you're still afraid? After 15 years, you still follow the council's words like a lost puppy? Sakura blushed heavily and said, Naruto was a monster. He tried to hurt us. No, he didn't. I was there. I saw it. I was freaking out. I admit that. But I had sense enough to see he didn't hurt us. Apparently I did not have sense enough later to tell the village to fuck off. But Tsunade-sama, no but, no nothing. He will come, and you can't do anything about it. It's been 15 years, Sakura, put your fears away and act like the Junin you are. The pink-haired woman's lips thinned out in obvious anger but Tsunade did not get afraid. It had been years since she had felt any kind of fear. That look won't get you anywhere with me. Get out of my sight, Sakura. The woman whirled around and slammed the door shut as she left. Tsunade raised an eyebrow and came to think of a snotty brat. With a sigh she went back to her paperwork. Sora sat in deep thought as Mibana peeked inside. Onikage-sama, she chirped. Hm? He replied, slowly coming back to his office from his stray thoughts. He tapped his chin absently, not quite in the room just yet. She was not faced by it as she was used to the Onikage's all moods. This was nothing unusual. Instead she just continued to chirp. Team betrayers are here to report. Send them in, he said, amused at her choice of words. She had started calling them that from the beginning, and now the three in the group did not even react. It was kind of true after all. The three men stepped inside and he looked at them, finally completely back from his thoughts. He had a lot on his mind. Success or failure? He asked them as they walked forward. Success, one of them replied, the apparent leader. Sorry we're late, Sora. Nah, it's okay, Sora replied and waved his hand. Take a seat. Any one of you in need to medical attention? No, they answered in chorus before they sat down. It was three rather different people that sat before him. The leader had waist long, black hair and a cloth around his eyes. His skin was pale and he was dressed in white combat pants, white shoes and a white shirt. He had a sheathed katana strapped to his back, and three scrolls attached to his belt. The one sitting to the right of the leader was slouched down a bit, looking bored. 
He had spiky, dark brown hair and black eyes. His skin was more normal looking, a bit like Yokeza's and his clothing was all black. He had a big scroll he normally had resting on the small of his back but he had taken it off and let it rest against the chair he was sitting in. The one to the left was quieter than the other two. His own dark brown hair fell over one of his eyes, the other one barely visible while the rest of the hair fell over his shoulders and down his back. The color of the eyes seemed to shift all the time, which amused Sora to no ends. His skin was pale as well, and he was dressed in a red trench coat, black shirt and pants underneath. He wore no kinds of weapons, and only one scroll attached to his belt. The leader's name was Hajutsu, the one to the right Kajenja and the one to the left Kanchu. I'm going to Konoha, Sora said to them after a moment's silence. Why? Hijutsu asked. I decided to see for myself if the village is the same as when I left it, the Onikage said. If the people are the same, if they all treat me as a monster, then they have not changed and there will be nothing between our villages. I do hope you are bringing people with you, Kajenja said and looked at the purple-eyed man. Wouldn't want you to be attacked by rabid citizens. I have decided on Yokazi, Koto and you three. Yokazi and Koto? Hijutsu questioned. They act like gentlemen, Sora said. Even among those who fears them, others won't be able to hold their tongues, and I have no wish for that. If they are going to visit our village though, they say one ill word, and I will not stop my people to speak their opinion. The three looked at each other and then at him. When are we leaving? Kanchu asked quietly, speaking for the first time. In two days, Tsunade was waiting by the main gate into the village, nervous. The council had objected her decision so she had decided to meet the Onikage and his people herself at the gate to ensure nothing would happen to her guests. Kakashi and Sasuke were by her side, as usual. The Chunins watching the gate stood with them, nervous as well but for another reason. She was nervous because she did not know how to act, they were nervous because a possible demon was coming. Of course, that was according to what they had heard from the council. There they are, Kakashi said and pointed. They are not in a hurry. How many? Tsunade asked and the Chunins grew more nervous and worried. She herself squinted and cursed her sight. Or maybe it was just Kakashi had eyes like a hawk. Or rather, I. Six I think, Sasuke said and squinted a bit to look. Yes, it's six of them. Kakashi nodded in confirmation. Not more? She mused. Normally a cage from a village is flanked by a NBU's twice that amount and then at least ten more people. Ah, it appears that Tsunade Haim is waiting for us, Yokazi said. How the hell do you know that? Kajenja asked. The wind tells me it's her. She is not alone. The two with Sharingan eyes are there as well as a few Chunins. They are called Chunins, correct Onikage-sama? Yes, Sora replied and looked ahead. Kakashi and Sasuke, why are they with her? We'll just have to see for ourselves, Hijutsu said. I feel they have no ill intentions against us. But others... Kanchu continued, they are a mass of hatred combined with pathetic fear. Be on your guard, Onikage said. Just because Tsunade maybe doesn't want to hurt us doesn't mean the others will stay away. Tsunade stood up straighter once she got vision of the Onikage. Her eyes widened, as did the others. He was tall, at least one head taller than Kakashi who was not short with his 181 centimeters. He also appeared to be thin but with strong muscles. He was dressed in black combat pants and a fish net shirt, over that a white robe. He wore no shoes. He was dressed rather normally. It was how he looked as a person that made them look at him in wonder or fear in the Chunin's cases. He had wild black red hair that went down his shoulders and seemed to go down to around his waist, the tips chopped unevenly. From the wild nest two pointed ears stuck out. His eyes were purple and bore tattoos underneath each in the form of three red dots. His skin was pale, making him look unhealthy. They saw him talk with one of them, and noticed he had fangs in his mouth instead of normal teeth. He had clawed finger and toenails, looking quite alike a demon. But his smile was gentle and kind, and eased her worries. While he looked dangerous, he did not feel like it. The five people around him were unknown to her except for Yokazi, she had gotten a glimpse of his face last time. Now none of them were dressed in the white cloaks and masks and Tsunade as well as Sasuke and Kakashi could get a good look at them all. Yokazi was wearing grey combat pants along with some sandals. He had a tight, black t-shirt and a grey vest over that. He also had elbow-long, black gloves on with some metal strapping. 
On his belt was several scrolls fastened and he had a holster for kanais on his right leg. The man walking next to Yokazi made Tsunade puzzled. He had white long hair, pale skin and disinterested half-lidded green eyes. He wore a white kimono of some sorts and had a katana strapped to the left hip. He should not fit in with the others but somehow he did. One of the other three had a cloth wrapped around his eyes and long black hair. He was dressed in white. She thought she saw the hilt of a katana sticking out from behind his back. One of them walked behind the onikage but appeared to have spiky, dark hair and dressed in black. The last one walked before the others, having dark brown hair that fell unevenly around his face and down his shoulders. He was dressed in red and black. Tsunade-sama? One of the chunins questioned warily. It's okay, she said. Go back to your post. She waited until they closed in and the leader for the blood village discovered her. His purple eyes bore into hers, challenging her to look away and she stood her ground. Onikage-sama I presume, she said with a small bow. Kakashi and Sasuke followed her example. Tsunade Haim, his deep voice replied, saying her name in a way no one else had managed. It seemed like his voice held a sort of magic in it, making you listen to him. An honor to meet one of the legendary Kona Hasanins. You know of me, I should be the one who is honored, she said. My companions are Hitaki Kakashi and Uchiha Sasuke. These are, what should I call you guys? Onikage said and looked at the five. Protectors, the one behind the demon-like man snapped, looking at the leader irritably. Tsunade found it a bit amusing. All right, let's go with that. My apparent protectors Koto, Yokazi, Hijutsu, Kajenja and Kanchu. They all nodded when he spoke their names. Kajenja glared at Sora due to the word, apparent. Onikage himself only looked amused. A pleasure to meet you all, Tsunade said and looked at them with a smile. Shall we move to the Hokage Tower directly? I suggest we don't walk there though, this village has too many narrow-minded people I'm afraid. I can see that, Koto said who shot a glare at one of the chunins a bit away. Onikage-sama, I suggest we do as Tsunadeheim says. The demon-like man looked around and saw someone giving him a glare a bit away from the gates. He bared his fangs, making the person shrink back in fear. Humans, he murmured and shook his head as if amused by the reaction of fear. I will never succeed to fully understand them. Tsunade looked at him when he said that, a bit curious. He saw it and continued. I'm not human as you can see. Demon blood flows in my veins, tainting my so-called humanity. Please, she said, you act nicer than most people I know so you can have whatever blood you want in those veins of yours. Follow me. If the six from the blood village were surprised, they hid it well. The three Konoha shinobi jumped up on a roof and looked behind to make sure they followed. Yokazi was gliding in the air with Koto by his side. Onikage made one jump and flew high up in the air before landing on a building and taking another jump. Chakra rippled through the air as he traveled. Kajenja, to their surprise, was nowhere to be seen. Hijutsu and Kanchu whirled out of view only to reappear again a bit further ahead. It looked like a sort of transportation technique although none of the Konoha shinobis could figure out what kind it was. They came to the tower and walked inside. Kajenja was still nowhere to be seen. Tsunade entered her office and sat down behind the desk. Onikage sat down and then raised a finger. He sent out a spark of chakra and shadows began to move on the ground. Kajenja slowly emerged from them and rose up. Kajenja is a bit of a lazy person, who says traveling short distances are troublesome, Onikage said with a faint smile. He travels as my shadow, once I send the chakra out he knows he can come out. Kajenja directed a half-hearted glare at his leader when he was called lazy but did not say anything. Onikage seemed to be more amused with Kaginya's reactions and glares rather than angry at the man because of it. As I have no idea what I should say or do at this moment, Tsunade said, hiding her smile when she watched them. Why don't you begin, Onikage-sama? The man thought for a little while, choosing his words. He looked straight at her and began. We both have an alliance with Suna but not each other. We three do not wish for a war, correct? She nodded, she had enough of war as it was. Then I suggest we ally with each other, Onikage said, to ensure Suna must not choose side if it comes to that. I must let you know some things before that, Tsunade said. For me, an alliance between us sounds ideal. But first you have to know what kind of village this one has turned out to be. Turned out? He asked, puzzled. 
The five around him seemed to tense a bit. Kakashi and Sasuke looked uncomfortable. Thirty years ago this village was peaceful, she said. All until the strongest biju through time attacked, forcing our Yandaimi to make a very hard decision. Oh, he sealed the great demon into a child, dying in the process, she said and looked straight at Onikage. That child grew up with these narrow-minded people, having no one to take care of him. I myself was not in the village, I had left it before that. Fifteen year ago, that was when I had been Godem for around three years, something happened. What happened? Onikage said, his insides in turmoil. Luckily Yokazi stood beside his chair. Otherwise the older man would have done something he would most likely regret later. The child lost control of the biju, and the biju killed the leader of the former organization Akatsuki. Yokazi's eyes widened slightly, he had not heard Sora san tell about it. But then again, Sora avoided Konoha as much as he could. The village wanted the child dead immediately, Tsunade said. That's when I made a mistake. A mistake? The demon-like man questioned, his heart beating faster. I let them banish him, she said and looked at a framed picture. She took it up and stared at it for a long time. She then gave it to Onikage and continued, that's the child. Uzumaki Naruto. He was 14 when I took that picture. Yokazi looked at the picture in wonder. So that was how Sora-san looked before. Blonde hair, blue eyes, whisker marks. On this picture he stood with, it could not be, that man, that white hair and those marks in the face. The man on the picture is Jiraiya, the Hokage said, an old friend of mine. Yokeza's breath hitched as he looked at Sora. The man shot a warning glance at him and the raven-haired man quickly obeyed, sliding a mask of indifference over his face. Sora would explain later, Yokazi knew that. The man just needed time to gather the right words. An old friend? Koto asked. Does it mean you don't see him anymore? He had been away when Naruto was banished. He came back, heard the news and walked out of the gate. I haven't seen him since. You said your mistake was you let them banish this Naruto-san, Kajenja said and looked at her. What makes you say that? I see that child as a son, Tsunade said, massaging one of her temples. Talking about Naruto hurt a lot but she was not going to stop. I have no children, will never have children except for that boy and I made him hate me. After that day, my love for this village was gone. A few of his friends disappeared as well, they could not stand it here I guess. I don't blame them. It sounds on you that many do not miss this child, Onikage spoke, finally giving the picture back. Not many did, she said bitterly and looked out as the sun began to sink down, leaving the sky in the color of red and orange. The only ones in this village who really does miss him I guess is me, Kakashi and Sasuke. There was one more, his name was Uruka, Amino Uruka, was, Onikage questioned, he's dead, Tsunade said shortly. Sora managed to hide his surprise at the news as Gara had not told him. Killed himself out of guilt, now he's just another grave, another name fading away in everyone's minds. This is what happened to our village, everyone here fears demons since that day 15 years ago. I have no doubt they would try to attack you, Onikage-sama, just because you look like one. The man sat silent for a long time. So, he asked, what? Tsunade was not sure she had heard right. It's not like I'm going to visit every day, he drawled out and looked at his sharp claws. If I send Yokazi here, he can bring you to death's cliff within a moment. Besides, this village gives me the creep. Welcome to the club, she said dryly, amused by his choice of words. Although we are only three that feel that at the moment. Well, now you are a few more, Kanchu spoke. I don't feel very well, being in this village. Let's go out for some air, she suggested. We can discuss the alliance outside. Instead of using the door, she opened a window and jumped out. The others followed. When they came to their final destination, the six outsiders looked around. A graveyard, Onikage said softly and rose up from his crouch. Sorry, we don't have any quieter place, Tsunade said. And while I'm here I can pay some respect to Aruka's grave. She moved forward, through the rows to get to Aruka's. While the others followed her, Onikage stayed behind. He looked around. What's up with Onikage-sama? Kakashi asked the five people. They all stayed silent for a while before Hijutsu spoke up, clearly not talking to any of the shinobi of Konoha. His chakra is sad again. That it is, Kajenja agreed quietly. Onikage-sama doesn't like seeing graves. Yokazi told Kakashi, 
Sasuke and Tsunade as they had stopped on their way to Uruka's grave. Our own graveyard holds too many children, too many we couldn't save. Too many that became victims to the brutality of humans. Onikage closed his eyes and took a deep breath. For a moment the two Sharingan users could feel his chakra, and indeed it was laced with sadness and pain. Then he opened his eyes again and began to walk. They killed children? Sasuke asked, both sad and angry at the same time. Of course, Yokazi said bitterly. If Onikage-sama hadn't saved me, I would have been beaten to death when I was seven. The three Konoha shinobi looked at Yokazi in horror. Which village was it? Tsunade asked. I don't know, Yokazi said. I don't remember, and I don't want to. All I need to remember is Onikage-sama and our village. Killing children, Tsunade said. That isn't right. That's just sick. Fear makes people act irrational, Onikage said and she froze. Gara had told her that not long ago, almost word for word. But after a while, if the fear remains, it turns to hatred. Hatred turns into the need to kill what they fear, no matter how young or old that person is. Humans are so easily corrupted with emotions, it makes me rather sad. We don't appear to be very nice, Tsunade said, when you put it that way. Not all humans are like that of course, he said. You can change, I've seen it before. I'm glad that you are not like most humans, Tsunadeheim. I have taken a liking to you and your two friends. Should we be honored? She asked. If you wish to be, he said with a shrug. Can't say why humans should be honored to have a demon as a friend. Naruto was my friend, Sasuke said, although I acted like a jerk most of the time, but he didn't give up about me. He continued all until I began to call him friend in my head. He was in the same team as me, Kakashi was our teacher. I was told what had happened with Naruto, I was in a coma at the time. I learned about his demon inside of him, and I didn't think less of him. Maybe I thought higher of him, the strength he must have to be able to keep Kayubi no Kitsune inside of him. Plus I think he made Kayubi softer, Kakashi continued as he looked at them. They had reached Aruka's grave and Tsunade was currently brushing away the leaves from the grave. You think so? Onikage said, his heart beating fast again. They did not hate him. They missed him. Tsunade, Kakashi, Sasuke, they really missed him. He wanted to show them, show them his village, his people. He wanted to tell them so badly, but could not. Not now. Not while he was in this village. If Kayubi had been like normal, he would have attacked and killed us, the copy Nen said and scratched his head. Yet the demon protected us, isn't that proof enough? Onikage smiled a bit at that and then Kakashi and Sasuke went to pay their respect to Aruka. The purple eyes strayed to the grave and then looked away. Yokazi placed a calming hand on his shoulder. I'm alright, Onikage reassured the five. Just, thinking about things I rather not think about. Then stop thinking about them. Kajenja said, trying to refrain from cuffing his leader over the head. He was tempted though. Suddenly a man entered and they grew alarmed. Tsunade looked back and said, Shikaku, it's been a long time since I saw you crawl out of your house. Quiet, the Nara muttered and looked at the six. Tsunade rose up and introduced him. It's the Onikage-sama from Blood Village and his companions Koto, Yokazi, Kanchu, Hijutsu and Kajenja. Everyone, this is Nara Shikaku. Evening, Shikaku spoke without great enthusiasm. They nodded to the scarred man. What brings you here, Shikaku? Tsunade asked. I don't know really, Shikaku said and scratched his head. I was suffocating and here it's nice and quiet. I can leave if you wish. No, it's alright, Tsunade said. What we are going to talk about will get known to the others soon enough. Will they like it? Nope, thought so, the man muttered. Well, whatever you plan to do. Tell me when you plan to tell them. I want to see their faces, although you can tell Shibi not to come. He's been at the meetings before, the Godem said, looking confused. And does it look he's enjoying himself? More like torturing himself, she muttered. When will he stop blaming himself for his son's disappearance? Same with me, never. Sora looked at the two, back and forth, making a quite funny picture of pure confusion. Yokazi chuckled at the sight. Not quite following, Onikage said to Tsunade with tilted head. She found it rather cute, considering how dangerous he should look like. Oh, sorry, Onikage-sama, I told you three of Naruto's friends disappeared. They disappeared around a year after him. Yes, two of them were Nara Shikamaru, Shikaku's son and the other one Aburame Shino, son to Shibi. 
Oh, the demon-like man said. The third one was Hayuga Neji. He didn't have any parents, and Hiyashi sure doesn't feel guilty about it. I can't blame them, the kids I mean, Shikaku said as he walked closer, hands in his pockets. He was dressed in simple dark gray pants and a gray shirt. His hair had begun to turn gray at the temples. Naruto was a good kid, made Shikamaru laugh. Shikamaru felt much of the world was boring but when he was with Naruto something fun always happened. Hey, you, your name was Kajenja? Yes, said man replied, a bit apprehensive. Hijutsu tensed slightly, ready to protect his friend and teammate. Do you all have special names? Shikaku asked and tilted his head, obviously curious. We have a tradition in our village, Kajenja said and looked at Onikage. He nodded and the man continued, when we become villagers there, we begin a new life. And a new life isn't complete without a new name. So your names aren't your real ones? Shikaku said. Correct, Kajenja said with a smirk. Most of us don't even know others' former names. I have no idea of Kotu's real name, or of Yokeza's. Hijutsu and Kanchu I know but that's because I traveled with them for a little while before we came in contact with Onikage-sama. Is your name Onikage or what? Shikaku asked the demon like man. No, Onikage replied. I have a friend who gave me my new name. It's from him the tradition comes from. You may call me Sora. Sora? That's my name, Sora said. Before my demon blood, I had blue eyes. He rarely shared his secrets with anyone but felt that these people did deserve it. Shikaku looked a bit amused and then said. Well, I better get going if I want to have a nap before nightfall. Lazy Junin, she muttered before realizing something. Onikage had described Kajenja as lazy and, while the others chuckled at her comment she snuck a glance at first Shikaku and then Kajenja. It definitely was a resemblance between the two, however vague it might be. Maybe, Kajenja was Shikamaru? Tsunade never got a chance to investigate further about Kajenja, as the hours grew late and they had much to discuss. She knew she glanced far too many times on the lazy shinobi, each time finding him more and more like Shikamaru yet not. Who was he really? Who were they all? Their names were not their real ones, not even Sora had the name Sora from the beginning. They were all people who had been thrown out or left their villages because of something they could not help. However, the Hokage could not help but grin quite evilly when Onikage and his companions had gone back home. Oh, she was going to have so much fun with the council now. She looked down at the scroll which they all had helped her to produce the formal text on. On it was the confirmation of their alliance, signed by her, Onikage, and their witnesses. Just to be safe, she had dragged Shikaku with her and forced him to sign. Onikage's five companions signed so she hunted down two more beside Shikaku, Kakashi and Sasuke. She came back dragging on Shizun and a very puzzled Shibi. They had signed as well, and now no one could change it except for herself and Onikage. She wanted to laugh out loud. Finally this village was going to make a turn around. She was going to make sure of it. She had been motivated by Onikage to make this village a better place for children with difficult conditions or outcasts. His eyes when he had looked around on the graveyard had been so full with sorrow as he must have remembered the graveyard in their own village. A graveyard with too many children buried, horrible absolutely horrible. Onikage was right on many things. Humans feared things too easily. Most of them never thought things through. They just went through with it, not caring who they hurt. But that was going to change, at least in this village. She would not give up until she died. And that brought her back to the meeting she was going to have soon, despite the rather late hour. Kakashi and Sasuke were slightly nervous hearing her evil cackle and slightly crazy eyes. The council grumbled amongst each other and turned irritated eyes towards her. She looked at them all and finally one of them snapped. Did you meet the demon today? First of all, Tsunade said, anyone in this room who will call Onikage-sama a demon in my presence I will personally deal with, and after that I will be more than happy to hand you over to Ibiki. Ibiki. Just the name scared them shitless. Maybe one of the few others she liked in this village beside Kakashi, Sasuke, Shikaku, Shibi and Shizun. He had not known Naruto very well, and therefore said he had no opinions about the child. Not once had Ibiki called Naruto monster or demon though, and Tsunade took that as a rather good sign. As predicted, they paled. Everyone clear on that? She asked cheerfully. They all nodded. How good. Then I will move on to the main subject in this short meeting, an alliance between Blood Village and Konoha. 
Absolutely not, several of them cried out. Actually, you don't have anything to say in this matter, she announced with a grin. Since we already have an alliance with them. What? Almost all of them shouted. When did that happen? Kakashi and Sasuke bit their cheeks to keep their laughter inside. Shikaku's shoulders were shaking, his head on the table. He was not very successful hiding his obvious amusement at their horrified faces. Shibi's chair was vacant. He preferred sleep over brief amusement. Oh, let me see, she said and pretended to think. She grinned wider and said, two hours ago I think. I am to visit their village in a few days. Then we demand to be allowed to pick out a group as your protection, and wonder who will be in charge of handling the village, Hayuga Hiyashi put in immediately. Shizun will be in charge, Tsunade said, with the help of Ibiki and Shikaku. And no, you can't choose a group, I will do that on my own. Now this meeting is over, so I bid you a good night. Her evil glint in her eyes told them that inwardly, she was laughing her head off at their expense. Brilliant Tsunade-sama but why do I have to be kind and in charge? Shikaku asked. Because you need to cheer up, Tsunade said. Besides, it will probably only be a day and a half, two days at the most. They gave me dirty looks as they left, the man whined. Stop acting like a baby and take the responsibility as a man, she said happily. You are unusually happy, Sasuke pointed out. Kakashi nodded. I know, she chirped. I have no idea why but meeting with Onikage-sama made me happy for some reason. Why? The three men asked, the only ones having stayed behind. Don't you realize, she said, if he has built up a whole village, Naruto might be there. But no one of them didn't seem to recognize Naruto, Sasuke said. Everyone changes their names, Tsunade said. Maybe Naruto never told his own name and he may have changed his looks before coming there. You think he's alive? Sasuke asked. I truly hope so, she murmured. She shook herself out of it and continued. Well, we should start planning but not until tomorrow. Go home and have some rest. I have to pick out a group. Can't you just take an Anbu team? The raven-haired man asked. I want to have normal Junins, she said. And not too many. Good Junins are those who fear demons the most, Sasuke pointed out. He did not need to mention some of the best Junins were in the same age as Naruto had been when he was banned and they all had vivid memories of Naruto in Kayubi form. Then I have to take those the least scared, Tsunade said. Like Hinata, that's one, Kakashi concluded. What, are you going to stay until I have picked a group? She asked. That's exactly what we are going to do, the three men said and sat down. Onikage-sama? Sora looked up from the scroll he was reading to see Kajenja. The man fidgeted, and Onikage frowned. What's wrong? Sora asked. Kajenja looked away a bit, causing Sora to frown deeper and patting on the floor beside him, saying silently the man should sit down. Kajenja came and sat down. The purple-eyed man was a bit worried, it was rare for any one of his people to come in the middle of the night to his home nowadays. Before, they came in groups and often stayed in the same room as their leader. More than once had Onikage had a person asleep in his lap, and it was no child he had been comforting. But now the fear had settled down and the visits had slowed down as they began to realize their new lives were working, no one came and tried to destroy it. Today, in Konoha, Kajen just struggled to find words. His hands were fisted, and he was fighting against the emotions he normally locked away. It had been a very stressful day today for Kajenja. I know, Sora said soothingly, rubbing the man's shoulder. I know. Kajenja leaned his head onto Onikage's shoulder and they were silent for a few minutes, the scroll lying forgotten next to the demon-looking man. The brunette finally looked at his leader and then promptly lay down. I see you are staying for the night, Onikage said with a somewhat amused but gentle smile. You can't move me, Kajenja declared, quickly snuggling up on his leader's thigh. Sora only picked up the scroll again and continued reading. Sora shook his head as he finished his reading and looked down. Kajenja had fallen asleep but the floor was uncomfortable to sleep on and Onikage was not going to sleep sitting up. The demon-like man rose up carefully, moving Kagemiya's head from his thigh and placing it on the floor before checking if the other man was in enough deep sleep. Concluding he was, Sora gently picked the man up and carried him the short distance to one of the guest rooms. He placed Kajenja on the futon and spread the covers over the man. That finished he got up and closed the door. He hesitated as he reached his own door. Sora turned around and went to one of the other rooms. 
He peeked inside and smiled as he saw the small lump moving around on the bed. Satisfied, he went to his own bedroom and closed the door. He lay down on his own futon and soon fell asleep to the faint sound of rain hitting the roof. Tsunade looked at the group she had scraped together. Hanada, Ino, Lee, Tenten and Konohamaru. They were the least afraid of demons after Naruto. And of course Kakashi and Sasuke would travel with her. She rarely left Konoha without one or both of them. You all know what I want of you, she said. All you have to say is yes or no. I'll go, Hinata said immediately. Me too, Ino continued. Tenten and Lee nodded. Konohamaru looked at her and said, Is there a chance that Naruto is there? We don't know, Tsunade told him. One might hope. Well, I'm going too, he said. Thank you, she said to the five of them. We are leaving tomorrow at 8 in the morning from the roof on top of this building. Yokazi, one of Onikage-sama's men, are meeting us there to take us to the village. Shouldn't we take the normal route? Tenten asked. Apparently Yokazi can bring us all there in a matter of moments, Tsunade said. Onikage-sama said it might be a bit faster than a three-day journey. In a matter of a few moments? Tenten said, eyes wide. Cool. That's apparently how Gara travels there, Tsunade continued. He will be coming with us as well. They all nodded and she dismissed them, wondering what the next day would bring. They all waited on the roof five minutes to eight. Gara looked out over the village, not speaking. The five Junins were talking quietly with each other while the two Sharingan users stood silent. Tsunade sat on the ground, trying to bring the stiffness from her body out. She was no longer young and the fact irritated her a bit. Suddenly a wind appeared and when it left Yokazi stood there. He looked around and said quietly. Good morning, are everyone here? Yes, Tsunade said and rose up. We better get going then. Yokazi nodded and said, if you all grab a hold of me, preferably on my shoulders. They did so although it was a tight fit. He looked around to make sure everyone was there and then made a sign. A scroll went up in the air and swirled around them. Transport, he shouted out. They felt a sensation of floating but they could not see anything clearly. And as quickly they had started, it was finished. Before we enter I would like to say a few words, Yokazi said as they looked around. They were no longer in Konoha but on a dirt road with vast plains on either side to sum up with mountains further away. The village is over that hill but Onikage-sama said I should warn you. Warn them, that did not sound good. Everyone, except for Gara, who already knew the rules, listened to him. First of all, once you enter our village you are at our mercy, Yokazi said. We do not fear to let newcomers know what we feel about their way of talking to us. So no name calling or degrading observations as most of the people in our village will see you as an enemy if you do. They all nodded. Second, most of the people in the village look different, Yokazi said. I was lucky to appear as normal while my abilities are not. Most of the others look like Onikage-sama, features they have no control over. They do not wish to be stared at. Remember that. Once again, they nodded. And thirdly, since our village is rather new, not all locations are permanent yet, Yokazi said. We have caught the young ones more than once practicing kanai thrown in the middle of the street. If you are attacked, look before the attacker before you decide to throw it back. Your attacker might be a child who missed its target. They nodded for the third time. He looked at them and said with a faint smile. I think you will do fine. However, if it had been one of those elders I met when I came for the first time, I might have considered skipping the warnings and letting them be killed. They stared at him at his bold statement and Gara sighed. One day you are going to get in trouble for that, the redhead said and Yokazi turned to smile at him. Then that day will come, and I will fight, the man said. I was taught never to lie. You are a bit too good about telling the truth, Gara deadpanned. The Konoha shinobis stared as they saw the gate to the village. It was bigger than Konoha's and painted pitch black. The walls ran higher up than in Konoha and were blood red. We are a bit paranoid, Yokazi said as they walked towards the gate. We like things high because it gives us the security that people has to work a bit to get inside. As they came closer, one of the people jumped down, most likely a guard. The Konoha shinobis took a second look, just to be sure of what they saw. The man looked normal enough if not for the tattoos covering his body. He was dressed in a pair of pants and a fur vest. He held a spear in his hands, not looking too friendly. Yokazi, he greeted. Case cage sama He then jerked his chin towards the others and continued. Onikage-sama's guests? 
Good morning, Moko, one, Yokazi said. Yes, it's his guests. Moko nodded and waved his hand towards someone up on the wall. They saw a woman nod and shout something out. A second later, the gate opened. The Konoha shinobis stepped into a village not too unlike their own. The main street brought them directly to what they suspected was the tower for the Onikage but it was far away. It seemed like the whole village surrounded the tower. Onikage-sama felt we didn't need to give him a whole building, Yokazi said as they began to walk inside. He was perfectly fine working from his own house, but in that matter we won. He seems to be a very nice man, Tenton said as she looked around. He is, the raven-haired man said. It's just that many can't see past his looks. They saw people on the street staring at them and did their best to not stare back. Many of them looked different as Yokazi had mentioned. Oi, Yokazi. They all turned to see a woman with green hair walk towards them. As the hair was up in a ponytail they saw gills on her throat that flexed once in a while. Her eyes were white and her skin pale. She licked her vermilion lips. Yasha, Yokazi greeted. You seen Makai around? She asked before glancing over at them. As she noticed they only eyed her curiously, she allowed them to look. No, I just arrived. Has he escaped your clutches? More or less, she growled. That man, he was supposed to report to Onikage-sama, that's why I'm looking for him. Use a tracking jutsu, Yokazi said. Didn't Kanchu teach you it? She smacked her forehead and growled. That's it, she declared. It's official, I'm an idiot. Yokazi shook his head in amusement and said. Try it, and if you can't find him let Onikage-sama deal with him. Only problem is Onikage-sama lets him off the hook too easily, Yasha moaned. Onikage-sama is too soft on people. The Konoha shinobis watched Yokazi to see his reaction. Tsunade knew Sasuke and Kakashi could react rather strongly if someone said she was too easy on people. To their surprise, he only laughed softly and said, Onikage-sama does not believe that punishment will make Makai better. True, she muttered. Well then, don't want to keep you any longer. But beware. My con, too, is just ahead. I will be careful, Yokazi said. As they continued walking Tsunade could not help but ask. Who is my con? He's a rather aggressive man, Yokazi said softly. His past is not up for discussion, and the only one he obeys is Onikage-sama. They left it at that. They did meet my con. He was a tall and thin man with glowing eyes and wild red hair. He glared at them and they noticed Yokazi did not try to make him stop. Maybe the man knew it would be no idea. Yokazi, the man suddenly said and the raven-haired man looked over at Maikon politely. Who are they? Guests to Onikage-sama, Yokazi replied, choosing his words carefully as his words would matter greatly. He requested their presence. Did you transport them here? He continued, as if wary for them. As soon as he caught one of their eyes, he looked away. Yes, I did, Yokazi said. He looked confused. Is something wrong, Maikon san? Maikon did not reply. He looked at them once more and then jumped up on a roof before disappearing. Yokazi let out a sigh and said, Well, at least he didn't try to tear my throat open like last time. They stared at him, even Gara. As I mentioned, rather aggressive, Yokazi said. I hope he will leave you alone now when he knows Onikage sama wanted you here. He does not like what we call pure humans, you with no strange abilities or looks but knowing you are here because of Onikage-sama he will most likely leave us alone. They had almost reached the tower when suddenly Hinata felt a pull on her leg. She stopped and turned around, therefore making the others stop as well. A girl, maybe four or five years old, stared up at her. Fuzzy fox ears stuck up on either side of the girl's head, out of the brown hair, making her look adorable. The girl was dressed in a blue dress and they could see a fox's tail sticking out in the back. Hinata blinked before kneeling down. Oni-san has pretty eyes, the girl said, touching the woman's face. And you have pretty eyes as well, Hinata replied as she smiled. It was true. They were blue, almost the same blue as Naruto's eyes. The girl giggled at the praise, the fox swinging a bit and said. Nay, where are you going, Oni-san? We are going to visit Onikage-sama, she replied and looked back at Yokazi. The girl apparently discovered him and then the rest. To their surprise, her eyes widened as she saw Gara and she shouted. Gara Jisan. She ran up to him and hugged his legs tightly. Gara fought with his balance for a moment before gently prying her arms away so he could lift her up. 
Strong as ever, just like your dad, Gara said to her. Right, Enkai, three. She giggled. The Konoha shinobis were surprised when Gara did not let her go but did not complain. They finally reached the tower and entered. They went up four flights of stairs before coming to where the Onikage was. A young woman sat on a desk outside the room. Hello Mibana, Yokazi said. She looked up at them and waved absently before yawning. She had fangs in her mouth. Her nails were sharp and she had faint marks of scars around her throat. No one wanted to know the reason. He's waiting, she said, brushing her pale blonde hair out of her brown eyes. Hello, Enkai Chan. Promise to be a good girl? I'm always a good girl. Enkai objected. I'm sure you are, Gara said as he pushed the door open. Just be aware we might have to send her out to you, Mibana san. That's all right, Mibana said, waving her hand up and down absently. They entered the office and stared. It was long with high windows, allowing in as much as light as possible. The Onikage's desk was at the far end, and in front was chairs for them all. The Onikage raised his head from whatever scroll he was reading and said, Good morning, your journey was safe? Yes, they all chorused. Then he saw the squirming girl in Gara's arms and smiled. He rose up from his chair and rounded the desk. He was dressed in black combat pants and a black vest with dark orange lining, his bare feet making no sounds as he walked. They noted now the girl was barefooted as well when Gara let her down. To their immense surprise she ran up to the Onikage and cried out. Daddy! Sora caught his daughter and swung her up. The Konoha shinobis widened their eyes. He was a leader and a father at the same time? Enkai seemed to want to smother him with kisses and hugs but Sora only laughed. He placed the bouncing girl on his hip and motioned to them to sit down. I did not know you had a daughter, Tsunade said carefully. Actually, she isn't really mine, Onikage said as he sat down. I found her when she was a few days old. Her mother was able to turn into a fox. She had been killed. Enkai looked up at her father and said, Daddy, what's wrong? Nothing's wrong, Sora said. Daddy lying. I can feel your chakra change, she said with a pout. I'm fine, you worry girl, Onikage said. Unfortunately we are going to be boring adults and talk about subjects that no doubt will make you fall asleep. How about you go out to Mibana? Enkai considered this, having apparently resumed her serious thinking position which only served to make her look even cuter. Finally she shone up brightly and said, And can me and Mibana go and say hello to Mekura? For, San? Of course you can, Sora said and let her down. Just don't annoy him too much. She seemed slightly disappointed over that before she bounced out of the room. Sora looked up at them and said first. Your brother is probably off harassing Makai, Gara San. Hence the reason why Makai isn't here to rapport. Figures, Gara said. Only Konkuro would be stupid enough to mess with Makai. Sora's mouth twitched in amusement. How is Mekuru doing? Gara continued. Ah, grumpy as usual. His vision is completely gone, Sora said. Finally I can sneak up on him, although he doesn't get very scared. When does that man ever get scared? Gara muttered and the Konoha shinobis wondered who they were talking about. True, Onikage agreed. Yokazi, did you bring them here directly? Yes, the man said. Hmm, we should probably go on a sort of tour I guess, Sora said and looked outside. Would you like that? Tsunade nodded and said. It seems like an interesting village. Oh, we have only the usual, Sora said and waved his hand before getting up. Does the village have a council that helps you decide on things? Tsunade asked the Onikage as they moved out into the morning sun. No, Onikage said. I know most villages have, but in order to make my people trust me I take the decisions on my own. I can get advice on how to proceed but in the end it's my word that is law. They did not comment on that although they felt it was a bit weird. Sora had taken a route that seemed to bring them to a small mountain. The village seemed to be built at the foot of it. You can see our village best from there, he said and pointed towards the cliff. It offers a good view of the whole island actually. They exited another gate and began walking upwards. It was a rather steep way up and they got tired easily. Yokazi and Sora appeared to be unfazed. Sora's feet dug into the soft earth yet when he continued his footsteps in the earth seemed to disappear completely. They reached the top of the mountain where the villagers had built a platform on. A few guards stood there and watched them warily. But as they were in their leader's company, the guards soon relaxed. 
Sora looked over the village as the Konoha shinobis took a chance to recover their breath before taking a look themselves. Konohamaru looked nervously at the Onikage but Tsunade had already told him the man did not recognize Naruto's name or looks. He sighed in defeat and decided to take in the beautiful picture of the village. They all had a feeling they almost was looking over Konoha from the heads of the former Hokages. Sora looked around the village as well, his head leaning into one of his hands when he saw three of his people fighting. He narrowed his eyes, they often had mock fights with each other but this one appeared not to be one. Onikage-sama, Tenten said. I think someone is fighting down there. Sora sighed and turned to Yokazi. Stay here, he ordered the younger man. No one harms my guests. I'll be back in a few minutes, hopefully. He jumped down from the platform and with one big chakra forced leap he was back in the village again. He saw the fighting and ran forward. It was Maikon who was being beaten to the ground by Rokuju, 5, and Akari, 6. Those two were a hassle to handle but they did not pick a fight with Maikon for fun. Nonetheless, he had to stop them. Akari was violent, and even he would be foolish enough to attack Maikon without thinking of the outcome, mainly, Maikon coming back and killing him. He tore the two away from Maikon and threw them away. Each of them crashed into the ground and immediately a crowd gathered. They were all uncertain of who to help of the three when Onikage spoke. Rokuju, Akari, your reasons for trying to kill Maikon? The two had the grace to look ashamed. Sora kneeled down and gently took Maikon's face in his clawed hands. The glowing-eyed man looked at him, one hand grasping Sora's left wrist weakly. Speak, Onikage roared. He deserved it, Akari shouted. He was a tall man and strong, although bony. His fierce red eyes shone in hatred, making him proud of his name. His wild blue hair was matted in Maikon's blood. He always deserves it. Within a moment, Sora came forward and hauled Akari up. In the next moment, Akari coughed blood as the leader had punched him in the stomach, hard. He dragged the man's face close and all but growled. He didn't do anything, right? You just had to release some of that fucking steam of yours? Rokuju just follows with you, knowing that with you he gets to take out his anger on someone else. Akari's eyes showed fear. Sora released the grip lightly and continued, his tone softer. Why do you have to hurt people all the time? They don't always deserve it. Akari tried to come up with something, anything, when the Onikage released him and said. Don't speak, Akari. I have to make sure Maikon is alright. The man turned his back to the red-eyed one who lost all composure he had. He fell to his knees and tried to fight against the tears. The tone Sora used was worse than any shouting or beating he had to endure during his life. The sound of a disappointed leader. The leader he looked up at in outmost respect was disappointed in him. Sora lifted Maikon gently and was soon on his way onto the hospital. Akari had to learn restraint, and if he had to hurt the man emotionally Sora would do it. The Onikage came back a bit later and met the Konoha shinobis. Yokazi looked at his bloodied arms and said. What happened? Akari that fool, Sora said and sat down. He flipped out again. The man shook his head sadly before staring at the blood. Did you hurt him or what? Tsunade asked. No, the blood is Maikon's. Akari attacked him, Onikage said. Shouldn't you be dealing with this Akari's punishment then? Konohamaru asked with wide eyes. He tried to kill someone. Our laws are different, Sora replied tonelessly. So you're going to let him be? Tsunade almost shouted, eyes wide. Gara looked at her and said. Be quiet, their laws are their laws. Well, the Onikage is going to let a violent man walk free, Tenten said, outraged. Sora washed his arms free from the blood and then dragged his fingers through his hair. Onikage-sama, Yokazi said, sensing the man was getting weary. And it was only morning. Sora looked at the arguing Konoha shinobis and Gara and then rose up. Yokazi, he said. The Konoha shinobis and Gara quieted to listen what he had to say. The black-haired man listened. Send a message to him. I'm sick of having to deal with Akari's foolishness. He knows what to do. Then go and tell Akari to see me tomorrow morning. It's his last chance. What will happen if he doesn't grasp the last chance? Tsunade said. Then I'll simply have to kill him, Sora said and looked away. Akari knows that. Yet he seems so uncaring about life. I wonder what I did wrong with that boy. What happened to him was not your fault, Yokazi said. His hatred is because of that human. That human? The Konoha shinobis wondered who. 
To their horror, the Onikage's eyes darkened and he growled out. Fucking Orochimaru, his death belongs to me. Too many lives he's already destroyed. He has created too many people like Akari. They all drew their breaths. Tsunade stared. Even this village had suffered her old teammate's evilness and greediness for immortality. Sora rubbed his face and continued. This seems like not the best welcome to our village, but I can't offer anything else, Tsunadeheim. I must be going to make sure Akari won't do anything foolish today. Yokazi, show them where they can stay and make sure they have what they need. Understood, Onikage-sama, Yokazi said, looking worriedly at Sora. I will send the message as soon as I can. What will you do? Talk to Mekura and Hijutsu about Akari, Sora replied. I'm not having another event like what happened just now. You're going to seal Akari away? Yokazi said with wide eyes. Seal his powers temporary, Onikage corrected, stressing on the word temporary. He's probably regretting what he did already but I have to make him understand. Sealing his powers away will fuel his hatred, the black-haired man said, ignoring their guests who were now staring at them. He will try to kill you, Onikage-sama. Many have tried, Sora said tiredly. None has succeeded. Why should he be any different? No more talking, go now. Tsunade and her group of people followed Yokazi silently. Gara stayed behind with Onikage. Sora sighed heavily, flopped down onto the ground and Gara sat down next to him. You're sending him to Jiraiya aren't you? Gara asked. Akari has a strange liking with Jiraiya, Sora objected and Jiraiya doesn't want him dead. At least when Akari is with him, he can relax. I'm not saying it's a bad suggestion. Actually it's a good suggestion, and I'm glad you're doing it. How is Maikon? He's fine, Onikage said. He wasn't even all that mad at Akari. Figured he had probably said something that made it snap with the guy. They both have such short temper. For being such an aggressive man, Maikon has a kind side. Or at least he can ignore people's anger. He gets that way with me, the wild-haired man said and looked at the sky. You are Maikon's hero, in his own little way, Gara said. Gara, I'm everybody's hero, Sora said with a light smile. I gave them new life. Yokazi see you as his savior, Enkai as her father, Gara said. To Maikon you are a hero, and for Akari you took away his pain. Sora closed his eyes and the guards looked at them worriedly. Gara waved away them, and they nodded before turning away. As long as Gara was there, their Onikage would be safe. The red-headed man slowly laid an arm around the Onikage and Sora relaxed. His head landed on the man's shoulder and Sora said, Being a cage is hard job. You've done far too much to give up now, Gara said. You always tackle the problems head on, why the change? I don't know, Sora said. I'm just so tired of seeing people getting hurt by Akari, I know it's not his fault. He's half crazy thanks to Orochimaru but still. It seems whatever I say to him is gone the next day. I know, Gara said quietly. I know. Mekura sniffed the air and said. Sora, what is it now? I can smell blood on you. Onikage stepped up to the man and looked at him silently. His black hair reached his elbows, currently put up in a ponytail and his black eyes stared unseeingly in front of him. He was dressed in dark gray combat pants, combat sandals and a black long-sleeved neck shirt. A black cloak was draped across his lap. Sora, I need your help, Onikage said. Mekura blinked. Why, Akari, it's his last chance, and until Jiraiya comes and gets him I want him restrained. So you want my sealing powers? If you wish to lend them out. I can't seal Akari alone. I know. That's why you're going to work with Hijutsu. Mekura stood up and draped the cloak over his shoulders. He took three steps forward before reaching out and laying a hand on Sora's shoulder. You seem tired, Mekura pointed out. I am, Sora replied. Akari does that to me. It's not his fault. I know. I hope he will be better when he comes back. I don't want him dead. I know you don't want to, the man said. He looked only to be a few years older than Sora. Now, shall we go? Sora reached out and pulled the hood over the man's face. Why? Mekura asked. Konoha, Sora answered and the black-haired man stiffened. It's alright, I won't let them see you. They then began to walk, Mekura holding one of his hands on Sora's arm. Tsunade took a sip of her tea as Tenten angrily cleaned her weapons. The woman was still mad about the village's laws and so did the others seem. They just did not radiate the same anger as Tenten did. We are in an alliance with them, Tsunade suddenly said and they all looked at her. 
We simply have to respect their laws. Their laws are inhuman, Tenton said. Well, they call themselves monsters, Tsunade pointed out. It's not right, the woman continued. Their laws seem a bit brutal, Hanata softly said. But I guess they have reason for it. What? Have reason? Tenton asked. What kind of reason? Well, the woman said and looked away. Onikage-sama probably has reasons to act like he does. Still, he seems rather brutal, Lee said. Saying he will kill one of his own villagers, not punishing a man who tries to kill someone. Who is the man Onikage wanted to send Akari to? Tenton wondered. Someone important probably, since he gets to deal with a man like Akari. Tsunade said nothing. She closed her eyes. This was getting out of hand. Tenton was upset over the laws. They all were. But she should know by now to respect other villages' laws when they were allied with said village. Suddenly it knocked on the door. Kakashi opened and outside stood someone they did not know. His yellow eyes watched them all in turn. Pale face looking white in the bad light of the corridor. He was dressed in grey clothing. Onikage-sama asked after one Uchiha Sasuke, the man said and looked around the room. They all tensed. Onikage-sama said he had someone who wished to see Uchiha-san. I'm Uchiha Sasuke, Sasuke said and stepped forward. Who is the person? We don't say his name aloud in case of a wrong person listening, the man said. Come, who are you? Sasuke asked as he stepped out of the room. The man slammed the door shut in front of the other Konoha shinobis, grinned at Sasuke and stuck out a snake-like tongue. Call me Makai, the man said. This way. Sasuke closed the door after himself and looked around nervously. He was without any backup and hoped Onikage would not let anyone attack him. Sora looked up and smiled lightly at him. A hooded person turned its head towards the Sharingan user. Sit down, Sora said softly and waved at a chair. Don't worry, he won't bite you. Fuck off, Sora, the hooded person said. It was a man. Sasuke gulped and sat down while wondering what Sora would do in response to the rude comment. Sora laughed only though and said, Kind as always, Mekura. Mekura? The blind man Gara and Onikage had spoken of earlier. Sasuke looked at them both in turn and then said, You wished to see me, Mekura-san? Yes, but first you must promise to not tell anyone, not even Tsunadeheim, of who I really am, Mekura said. Sasuke sat up straighter, looking at the man sharply. Onikage was already engrossed in some scroll, seemingly having forgotten the two. Our real names are forgotten, dead, buried in the ground, gone and I will only say who I was once, and that will be to you. Sasuke looked intently at the man. Pale hands removed the hood, and the Sharingan user saw someone he did not expect at all. Sasuke opened the door and they all looked at him. Who was the person you met with? Lee asked. This Mekura, Sasuke said. He had been told about me being an Uchiha with the Sharingan eyes and was curious. No asking about our village? Konohamaru asked. Nope. He asked if it was any difference of course, but what I told was nothing people didn't already know about us, Sasuke said. He wasn't that interested. So that was all? Tsunade said. Yes. Sasuke lied without hesitation. The group moved to get back to Konoha the following day. They stepped out on the main street and wondered about the quietness of the village. It was 9 in the morning but they expected more noise than it was. Suddenly they saw Sora coming walking with a hooded person next to him. They all watched the two. Sora was dressed in black combat pants and a white robe with a cloak over his arm while the only thing they could see of the hooded person was the black cloak and grey combat pants with sandals. The two of them appeared to be arguing. How come so many people are hooded in this village? Lee asked. Maybe they don't want to show their faces, Tsunade said. I don't think they are dangerous. Onikage looked around for a bit and then shouted out. Akari. They saw a person edge closer. He looked sick, and his eyes never once looked at his leader. So that was the person who Sora threatened to kill. As quickly as Akari had dared coming close enough, Sora took the cloak he had over his arm and put it around the blue-haired man's shoulders and said something to the man. Akari for the first time looked Sora in the eyes and nodded a bit. The Onikage sent the two hooded people off and his shoulders sagged a bit once he thought no one would see. He dragged his clawed fingers through his hair and they now saw dark rings underneath his eyes. He doesn't seem to have had a good night, Tenton said worriedly. She was still angry about their laws but not once had she seen Tsunade in that state of exhaustion. A person jumped down next to Sora and Tsunade saw it was Kanchu. The Onikage looked over at him and said, 
What is it? Enemies are coming to the island from the north, Kan Chu said. They are traveling in one boat, twenty people in all. None of them are over Junin level. What do they want? Sora asked even as he began to walk north. Your death as usual, the man replied. Get Hijutsu and Kajenja, Sora said and now discovered the Konoha shinobis as Kanchu jumped away. I'm sorry, Tsunadeheim and you others but it seems like I will not be able to see you off. Yokazi will bring you home in an hour. What about you? We heard about the enemies, Tsunade said. I will be fine, the man said. I have too much to do to allow myself to die just yet. Besides, they are all only Junin levels. Only Junin levels? Only? Was he crazy? Sora jumped away, and only after a moment's hesitation they followed. They were not going to let him go alone. Sora saw the enemies as they got onto land and swore. He saw a few corpses on the boat and knew they had killed some of the fishermen living on the island. The anger flared up inside of him. They may not be his people but they lived on this island and were not dangerous. They simply wished to live in peace. They did not deserve death delivered like those on the boat. He could feel his allies behind him but could not be bothered with them at this moment. His hands flexed and his eyes turned sharper. Time to show Tsunade and the others just what kind of people Konoha were allied with now, and what they did towards their enemy. Tsunade saw the Onikage prepare to attack and tried to run faster. The man was alone against 20 people. It would be impossible for him to defeat them all. Sora jumped up in the air and swirled around. Once he stopped he had two katanas in his hands. The enemies saw him and prepared to attack. With one great boost of chakra, he was amongst them and spun around. The screams echoed in his ears as blood splattered onto him. He jumped away, seven of the people dead. The Konoha shinobis stared at the bloodied form of the Onikage. His purple eyes became lighter and lighter, shining up and his hair appeared to be wilder and his nails longer. He threw the katanas away and brought his hands together in a seal. Five more followed rapidly and he shouted out. Kaikiri, one. Mist made of blood surrounded him and the enemies. The Konoha shinobis wisely stopped and watched with wide eyes. He jumped out from the mist, formed some other seals before picking one of the katanas up and screamed out. Kuroi Habi, two. A snake shot out from the blade, became the blade and he spun around to send it into the mist. His movements were fast, deadly, and they all stared. This was a true fighter, a true demon. He seemed to be born to fight. Screams erupted and Sora pulled the katana back. He threw it away again and slid his thumb on one of his sharp teeth. He slammed the hand into the ground and shouted out. Kachiyose no jutsu, Tumankai. Kyoko, 3. As the mist cleared Tsunade and the others saw it were still 10 enemies standing up. Smoke billowed from the ground Sora had hit his palm on and out from it came something, speeding up into the sky. It's a dragon, Tenton shouted. The dragon roared and swept down towards the enemies. At that moment, Kajenja, Kanchu and Hijutsu arrived. Kajenja saw the enemies prepared to move away from the dragon and slapped his hands together, making a seal. Cage main no jutsu. They all stared, it was a Nara jutsu. Shadows shot out from underneath Kajenja, creating waves of shadows speeding towards the group of enemies. The enemies were surrounded, trapped, unable to move. They tried to get away but could not move one inch. Kanchu. Kajenja shouted. Hijutsu. They both ran forward as Kyoko took out three of the shinobis before hovering over them, making sure nothing happened. Sora looked on as his people fought. Maybe summoning Kyoko was a bit too much but the Onikage only shrugged mentally. What was done was done. Hijutsu unsheathed his katana from his back and with one graceful move severed a man's head from the rest of the body. Kanchu stretched out his hands and he was surrounded by black, what was it? It came from the ground, from the air, from Kanchu himself. Insects, Hinata suddenly said, he can control insects. Within a few moments, all but one was dead. Kajenja made a seal and rose up from his kneeling position. The shadows did not move from the bound man even as Kajenja began to walk forward. Sora rose up from his crouched down position and the mighty dragon landed behind the man. It's been a long time since you have summoned one of us, the dragon spoke. I am honored I was the one in your mind when you summoned just now. Brutality fits me, Sora said. Therefore you are the best of all the dragon summons. Kyoko's laughter sounded like a roar and the dragon shook its head. Sora dismissed it and slowly it faded from view. Alright, 
Ka Zhen just said and was looking at a paper in his hands. Tsunade blinked in confusion as he scratched his head and read on. He looked over at the remaining alive enemy and started, Question number one, who sent you guys here? He was reading from the paper, and so slowly it almost made Tsunade burst into hysterical laughter. In a strange way he was mocking the prisoner. The enemy kept his lips tightly shut. Kajenja took out a pen from God knows where and said, All right, Mr. Prisoner refuses to answer question number one. Question number two. For what reason are you here? Not a word passed the man's lips. Kajenja sighed and said, Come on, sooner or later you have to answer the questions. I prefer doing it the nice way. And what is the nice way? The enemy finally asked. This way. Kajen just said as if the man was an idiot. Otherwise I have to give you to Makai and Yasha and believe me. You don't want to be with Makai and Yasha. They really know how to make a person scream in pain. The enemy gulped and closed his eyes but still refused to speak. Kajenja groaned and said. This is so troublesome. Someone handle the guy. If he's not gonna answer the questions why bother reading them up? Hijutsu, use your technique, Sora said as he walked forward. I have a fair guess where they come from but do it anyway. Understood, Hijutsu said and turned to the man. He kneeled in front of the enemy and brought his hands together before placing the tips of his fingers on each side of the man's head. The enemy began to yell. What the hell are you doing? Hijutsu tensed up and so did the enemy. The man's mouth fell open and his eyes became blank. Who sent you? Hijutsu demanded to know. S. Sound Village? Orochimaru-sama. The man's voice was quiet, devoid of anything and Kajenja whined out. Could have told me you were gonna do that from the start. What were your orders? Hijutsu continued, ignoring the shadow user. Kill, kill the demons? All or anyone special? Kill, the Onikage? Same business then, Sora said lightly. Good riddance, they never give up. We know enough already, Hijutsu. Kill him. Hijutsu ended the technique brought his katana out and swiftly removed the man's head from the body. He sheathed the sword and said, If you may, Onikage-sama. Sora made two seals and said, Kaden, Shiroi Hisaki, 4. Blinding white flames came out from his mouth and the corpses began to burn. Orochimaru needs to be dealt with soon, Sora said and shook his head. His attempts of attacking me are getting rather annoying. True, Kanchu said and looked around. Should we identify the fisherman? I know who it is, Sora said. It's Baraki San and his two sons. Their boat is the only who that could handle 20 people at once. Baraki San has a wife and a small daughter, Hijutsu said. Who will tell them? I will, Sora said. Bring Tsunade Haim and her friends to the village. Get Yokazi and make sure they get back to Konoha safely. I bid you farewell, Tsunade Haim, and I hope everything will be well until our next meeting. She nodded to him and watched him walk away to the water to wash the blood off. As they walked towards the village, he walked towards a small village by the shore and they knew the news he brought would destroy two people's lives. Yokazi looked at them all as they appeared on the Hokage Tower. Tsunade looked around at her village and said, Well, I guess you should say home, sweet home here. Sasuke stared off into space, clearly not paying attention. Tsunade looked at Yokazi and said, Thank you for bringing us back, and have a safe journey back. Did Gara decide to stay in Blood Village or? I will take Gara-sama and Konkuro-san to Suna later in the day, Yokazi said. Gara-sama had something he wished to talk to Onikage-sama about. She nodded and with a seal, he vanished again. A few days later, Tsunade rubbed her eyes and sighed tiredly. Kakashi and Sasuke looked at her. What is it? They asked. They had not been with her that day so they did not know what had been said. Orochimaru, she said. Sasuke, he's looking for your brother. For, Itachi? He wants the eyes. Mekura sneezed. Enkai looked up at him with wide eyes and then exclaimed pointing at him even though she knew he could not see it. Someone is talking about you, Mekura-san. Mekura rubbed his nose a bit and replied quietly. Maybe, Tsunade rubbed her temples as Sasuke and Kakashi looked at her. How the hell are we supposed to find a missing nin who also happens to have a price on his head? She asked. Believe me, I rather have his finding Uchiha Itachi than Orochimaru getting his hands on the man. True, but shouldn't Itachi be able to hide himself? Kakashi asked. He's not that weak. Who knows, it's been a long time since we heard anything about anyone from Akatsuki, Tsunade said. It seems after the leader died they all just disappeared. 
Sasuke kept quiet. He had promised. He could, and would, not tell. Sora looked over the village from his office, lost in thoughts. Scrolls and papers covered the desk but he had abandoned whatever he was working on, choosing to look at his village. His village, he may have not become the Hokage, but he was a leader. He had people to take care of, and people who respected him no matter who he was or what he did do. That was more than Konoha had ever been to him. Onikage-sama? He slowly turned to look at Mekura. The man walked forward, hand against the wall and then stretched the other out to feel the table. Once he came to the desk, he sat down and managed to find Sora's head. Mekura? The man petted the wild hair a few times before settling his hand on top of the other man's before saying. They're trying to find me. They who? Everyone. Well they won't, Sora said. You are safe here. I know that, Mekura said. Otherwise I wouldn't have come to this village in the first place. Sora smiled a bit. So we are going to find Uchiha Itachi? Sakura asked. Why? Because Orochimaru wants his eyes, Tsunade said. Rather we have him than that snake. What are we going to do with him? Kiba asked next. I don't know yet, the woman said. He is to be given a fair trial and then we'll see what happens. The team before her nodded, and she dismissed them. Sakura stayed behind though and Tsunade felt a vein tick uncomfortably. Is there something you want Sakura? She asked as she began looking through reports. I want to know how the village was, Sakura said. What village? The blood village, the pink-haired woman said. It was just fine, Sakura, Tsunade said. It looks a lot like our own. Her lips thinned and then the woman dropped what she thought was the bomb. I heard that their laws were different from ours. Of course they are, Tsunade said. Not everyone has the same laws as us, Sakura. I don't think anyone has. I heard they were inhuman, Sakura said in triumph. The Onikage is fair, I have seen it, Tsunade said. He gives his people chances when we would kill them for treachery. Now get out. The last known location of Uchiha Itachi was in Kumo. Tsunade read out and looked up at the team that consisted of Sasuke, Kiba, Sakura, Tenten, Lee, Hinata, Ino and Choji. The old rookie nine, what was left of them, along with two-thirds of Team Guy. A nostalgic sight. She shook her head a bit and continued. The reports say he was seen stumbling down a street, bandages over his eyes. It's possible he has lost his eyes, and then Orochimaru is looking in vain. We still want to make sure of that before we take any conclusions. I have looked at an old medical report I managed to find on Itachi, and there it states his vision was deteriorating. His sight maybe will is gone, but does that mean his Sharingan is gone as well? Sakura asked, for once professional and not just bitchy against the Hokage. Sasuke? Tsunade asked, looking at the man. I have not that much knowledge about the Sharingan, Sasuke admitted, but the Sharingan should stay even if you lose your sight. Sharingan is controlled by chakra, not sight. As long as you have chakra, the Sharingan should remain active. So we have to find him. Even without his sight, Itachi is a force we rather not letting Orochimaru getting his hands on. Are you going to Konoha again? Sora nodded to Kaginya's question without looking up from the paper he was reading. Sora-san, I would appreciate if you looked at me. The Onikage looked up curiously at Kajenja who continued, Konoha is not safe. Yes, I know, but I have you protectors, don't I? Don't twist around my words like that. But it's true. It was hard for Kajenja to not hear the pout in the man's voice. Onikage-sama, wow. It was not often the man spoke to Sora in that tone. Please, I have a bad feeling about this. Are they betraying us? Not Tsunade and the people she trusts, but, the village, it reeked of hatred. I know. And yet you're going? Kajenja demanded to know. We are to have a meeting what we are to do with Orochimaru, Sora said. We decided to have that one in Konoha. Future meetings we will jump between Konoha, Suna and Blood. Please, you can't go there. They will attack you. Then I'll kill them, Sora said with a smile that made shivers go up Kaginya's spine, and against his will he took a step back. The chakra the man emitted from his chair reeked of death. Don't worry Kajenja, I will be fine. And if I am attacked, I always have you, right? Kajenja looked at his leader and walked forward. He sat down heavily on the arm of the chair and put his head down on Sora's shoulder. Hmm, you are usually not like this, Sora noted. Is it only because of the people in Konoha or something else? I'm just being paranoid, Kajenja replied. Then you can stop being paranoid, Onikage said. You know I'm quite impossible to take down. Still, 
Hush now, stop fretting, Sora said, placing a hand on Kagenya's head. You're there with me, so I have nothing to fear. As I stated before, stop twisting around my words like that you fucker. Sora only smiled. Tsunade greeted Angara with a smile and said, How are you this wonderful day? Better if your council didn't try to glare a hole into your head. Oh, don't worry about them. They are just acting like idiots. Is it because Sora is going to arrive in a few minutes? Gara asked. Yes, she said. I don't care that much about it though. They can glare and nag all they want. He's still coming. A moment later a great wind started and once it ended, Sora had arrived with the same group as before. The council tensed while Tsunade and Gara smiled. Good morning to you all, the woman said. Welcome back to Konoha. Thank you, Tsunadeheim, Onikage said and stepped forward. For today's honor he was dressed in white, white combat pants, a white long-sleeved shirt and over that a white vest. There was a belt of scrolls around his hips, the scrolls blood red and sealed. It seems like your council is not as happy to see me. Ignore them, Tsunade said. God knows I do. The council now glared at them all but shrunk back as Kodo began to unsheathe his katana. All ANBUs grew alert, their chakra tensing in the air. Koto, don't, Sora said and looked at the white-haired man. Whatever you are thinking, it's not worth your head to be gone. Koto considered this and let the katana slide back. He crossed his arms and glared back at the council. Yokazi shook his head helplessly. Shall we go then? Onikage said as if it had never happened. As they seated themselves in Tsunade's office, the council members sat as far away from Sora as possible. Gara sighed as he saw this before seating himself next to the Onikage, his council members seating themselves near him. The demon-like man's companions did not sit down. You are allowed to sit, Tsunade said to them. We prefer standing, Tsunade Haim, Yokazi said politely. More like not allowed sitting, one of the Konoha shinobis muttered. What was that? The Hokage asked sharply. More like not allowed sitting, Inazuka Sume repeated looking at the Onikage as if daring him to reply. We prefer to stand, Kodo said with a deep chilling voice, in case of an attack. Why? She challenged. Use your brain if you have one, Kodo snapped. Stop it, Onikage said and the white-haired man immediately cut off any further words with a snap. He glanced at his leader and then turned to stare out the window. I would appreciate to not egg my people on, as they have a tendency to answer with rather harsh words. Then make sure they know how to be quiet, Sume said. I believe I don't like your tone, Sora said. Maybe you should learn when to bark and when to stay foot. Sume was halfway up her chair when Shikaku grabbed her arm and wrenched her back down. Don't play around with death, he muttered in her ear before releasing her. He may not like her attitude but she was important for the village's survival. Everyone settled down, Tsunade said and looked around. How are we supposed to be allies when all we can do is arguing like children? We never agreed to become allies with the blood village. He or she said, venom in his voice. Told you so, Kajenja murmured in the leader's ear. Hush, Sora whispered. Let's see where this leads. We are allies with Suna who are allies with blood. Only natural blood and Konoha became allies, Tsunade said. You just want to find that Uzumaki brat. He or she spat. At once, the room became silent. Sora raised an eyebrow. Kajenja gave out a near snort before Hijutsu discreetly elbowed him. The Onikage leaned back in his chair and watched the outcome while Gara looked at him strangely. Before Sora had wanted to tell Tsunade who he was after the meeting with her, Gara knew that. But now, it suddenly seemed like something had changed. But what had changed? Was the man backing off from telling the Hokage? He was not scared of that, Gara knew that. He had been in the beginning, scared to tell Tsunade who he was however now. It seemed like he was not even scared to kill her if he had to. What had changed? Tsunade, unaware of the redhead's thoughts, looked at Hiyashi long and hard. I am not out to find Naruto, she said. He has not allowed himself to be found in 15 years, so he clearly doesn't want us close. Yokazi glanced down at Onikage but he did not betray anything. In fact, he did not look interested in the conversation. Yokazi bit his lip and wondered what could be the cause for the sudden change of heart. Sora-san? Sora looked up to see Yokazi enter the room. He put down the scroll he had been preparing and patted the floor next to him. The younger one sat down and said, Why? Why have you not prepared to tell Tsunadeheim who you are? Onikage glanced up at him for a moment before returning to his task. 
Yokazi knew it was a sign to wait for a few minutes until Sora was done. Indeed a few minutes later the older replied, I frankly don't know, why not? At first I was scared as a small child about telling, Sora said with a curl of disgust. Then I regained myself and wondered why I should. I've turned this around a lot and still haven't found a fucking answer. Crude language was not known to come from Sora's mouth so Yokazi was surprised. One part of me wants to tell, Sora said, adding a few strokes on the scroll. Another wants me to wish them to hell. The part that was wounded deeply by their looks when I was weak. Sora-san, this is not you, Yokazi said and stared at the man. I know, Sora said and looked at Yokazi. I'm afraid I'm turning into something I was before. And what was that? Quote ellipsis. A true monster. What are you fretting about? Sora suddenly whispered to him as the argument continued between the Konoha council. About what you said earlier, the younger man replied quietly. Ah, don't worry about it. I will figure it out sooner or later, Sora said and smiled a bit at him. It has just been a few tough weeks. Yokazi nodded, not knowing what else to do. He just wanted to get that empty absent stare that Sora had had for several days. Gara had interfered into the argument while they had talked and now said. We are not here to argue why we allied, we are here to discuss what should be done against Orochimaru's recent attacks. They are probably allied with Orochimaru, one of the council members shouted, pointing at Onikage. The next moment Koto was by him, katana against his neck, Yokazi aiming his palm against the man's heart and Kajenja stood on the table with shadows twisting around him. Never say to my people, or to me, that we in any way are connected to Orochimaru, Sora said dangerously low, his eyes flaring intense blue for a moment. Chakra was seeping out from him, anger mixed with it. We tend to react, a bit violently. While Kanchu and Hijutsu had not moved they were reeking of Chakra too, both of them tense and Kanchu glaring at the one who had spoken. The rest sat silent in shock and perhaps fear. Yokazi, Kajenja, Kodo come back here, Sora said. I think they know now what we think of Orochimaru. Fucking snake, he's getting it one day, Kajenja muttered and walked across the table to jump down next to Sora again. Twin whirls and then Koto and Yokazi had joined the Onikage. Sora whispered something in Yokaze's ear and the younger man nodded before sliding his face into a blank mask. Shall we talk or not? Onikage asked with a cold look. If you are content with arguing like little brats, I fear I have more useful things to do than listen to your petty arguments. Gara stared at him, this was definitely not Sora talking. Was he giving in to his old hatred? Or was he just endlessly frustrated? The Konoha council sat in shocked silence and Tsunade heaved a sigh of relief. Alright, we will act like adults now, she said sternly and looked around the table. The presence of Kakashi and Sasuke behind her gave her strength. With a small grin she said, those who wants to continue argue I will send to the corners like stupid little brats like Onikage-sama just said. I have other things to do as well if you don't behave. Sora cracked a smile at that, and Tsunade was pleased when most of the council went beat red. Seems like you got your children under control, Sora murmured. Should we be envious of Gara-san, Tsunadeheim, who has such nice children compared to us? Hey, we're not like them. Kajenja protested and pointed at the Konoha council. I beg to differ, Sora sniffed and Gara finally smiled. He was returning, the Sora Gara knew. Good, the meeting progressed without problems although most of the members of the council from Konoha glared at either Tsunade or Sora. Sora paid them no mind. Within a few hours they had a vague plan laid out. Spies from Suna would watch Orochimaru while Konoha and Blood built up their force. The council members save for Shikaku and Shibi glared at Sora at the comment, built up their force, claiming, the demons probably were ready to strike anytime, which made Onikage a bit annoyed. Sora-san, your eyebrow will soon have a permanent twitch, Yokazi informed when the council members from Konoha and Suna had exited the room after the meeting. Said man glared at Yokazi and slowly unclenched his fists. They were beginning to go on my nerve, the man admitted. Hey, at least you didn't kill them, Kajenja offered and Tsunade choked on her breath a bit. Small miracles, Koto said. If he had, they would have deserved it. Don't start arguing you two, Sora said as the two glared at each other. I've heard enough brat arguments for today. I'm not a brat, Kajenja whined. You are whining, Koto pointed out. A classic sign. Koto, don't start, Sora moaned. 
He rubbed his temples as Gara got up, stretching after having sit for a long time. Need some fresh air? Tsunade asked. No, I'm fine, Sora said. Yokazi suddenly produced a glass of water to the man who took it with a grateful look. Are you a mind reader? Tsunade asked Yokazi with a faint smile. I merely know Sora-san's needs, Yokazi said, although he expresses them far too little. Don't look at me like that, Sora complained. I do speak up with what I need. Yes, but far too seldom, Hijutsu said quietly. You insist of our own comfort before your own. Don't start with that again, Onikage groaned. I told you already, I'm your leader and supposed to it that way. Every leader does. But who said we are the normal village? Kanchu asked. Not you too. Tsunade laughed quietly as Sora groaned and let his head hit the table with a thud. Sora had just exited the building along with Tsunade, Sasuke, Kakashi, Gara, and his people when a kanai came towards him. Yokazi caught it and swung it right back before Sora could say anything. It barely missed Hanabi, who had thrown it from the start. Hanabi, what are you doing? Tsunade shouted, pale of rage. What are you doing? The Hyuga replied. Inviting monsters to our village like it's nothing. Making them allies to our village, when everyone knows demons stab you in the back. Kodo growled and had his katana out within an instant. Onikage held up a hand, and reluctantly the white-haired man lowered the blade. His purple eyes locked on the young woman, who now held another kanai ready. No one moved to stop her, some of the villagers silently cheered her on. Stabbing people in the back. That is what your village has done, Onikage said, his voice deadly. Hanabi's hand wavered a bit, her eyes full of confusion. Don't try to hide it. You got rid of a so-called demon child 15 years ago, stabbing him in the back when all he wanted to do was to help. What do you know about it? He or she shouted, eyes blazing of anger. Because I know your demon child, Onikage said and people gasped. Tsunade's eyes widened. Sora's next words made her heart break, and he wasn't willing to forgive this disgrace to village. Gara stared. Sora was vibrating in anger long overdue, and he looked at Yokazi. The man was at his leader's side swiftly and the blood villagers grabbed onto the youngest of them. Sora placed his hand on Yokazi's shoulder and then looked over at Tsunade. He knows those who regretted it, the demon-like man spoke to her, quietly. Just so you know, Tsunade Haim. And then they were gone. That's all for now if you enjoy then please like share and do comments.